on social media which may produce negative So if it is a standard, it allows you to specify as to what is something bad. And then the machines, in terms of their policy, they have a way of knowing that if something is bad, what would I do? And how do we communicate this information? This communication information is communicated over another standard called text. So here is a practical example. In the digital world, where you have a very large ecosystem, where you have events taking place at in time frames which are far shorter than human reaction times. And the scale is such that it's just impossible for human beings to do this. The only reason this whole thing works is because there is an underlying standard. So more and more, as I mentioned in my earlier slide, that computers are intermediaries in almost everything that we are doing. Okay? And policy makers and lawmakers would like to bring in lots of regulation, let us say there is pollution, there is environmental things. How do I ensure compliance? My old compliance techniques or conformance techniques may not be okay. I may have to create these ecosystems where policy is poor. And this code is directly understood by you know millions of machines and this dissemination happens in the So that is the far end of the spectrum. That is the you know in, in some sense the abstract world. And we are making such good. So in all of this, it's important to see that you know when we talk about digital, can we characterize this? So since, since I am now wearing the hat of a professor, I always do have a little bit of an academic uh, bit of an orientation. So how do we characterize this? What is digital? And one of the key components of digital is simulation of digital or real systems by their information models. And this reduces real world processes to the processing of data. And we know with our experience in computer science that this can be a very dangerous thing if not managed very carefully. Data itself has peculiar properties. It's non drivable If I use a data, it doesn't exclude somebody else from it. But if I use water, there's that much less water for other people to use. So when we reason about data, our intuitions about how we use other types of assets are not necessarily very reliable. And the manner in which data can be monetized has resulted in new business models. So when we have use of the internet, what is the and this creates issues and hazards in jurisdiction and sometimes the application that national sovereignty is being given. And this is necessarily why I know all these policy issues. When we talk about this, when we talk about the idea of the when we talk about the idea of the future, that is the time when the policy makers realize that the policy is not far from national. Thank you. 
Okay, text produced by AI, for example, should have a watermark saying generated by AI. Now, uh, uh, this is a, a table. I don't think I'll go into the details of these tables, where uh, the author, Makridakis, and the paper came in Science Direct in 2017, compares the AI revolution with uh, digital revolution, the computer power, and industrial revolution, the mechanical power. He compares mechanical power, computer power, with brain power, which is the reality of today. Now, uh, actual elect use of electrical appliances in 50s, use of uh, cars in 1960s, uh, ch changed profoundly the way we uh, live in this world. Then uh, coming to computer power, the actual use of smartphones and uh, uh, you know uh, work from home, these are new realities made possible by computers and internet. And we see uh, the AI revolution in the form of neural net reading handwritten digits, robot navigating using vision, interacting with the outside world with natural language and so on and so forth. Many uh, points which are uh, question marks like 202 question, computer translation, self-driving car are already realities in today's world. Translation is of extremely high accuracy as has been seen by us. Now, 
uh, I would like to uh, show to you an experience of what uh, AI can do, uh, taking two, one or two examples. One is opinion summarization. Here the problem is that e-commerce companies are interested in knowing what customers think about their service and product. Now we have worked on a uh, summarization model which uh, takes the reviews, customer reviews present on the internet but uh, this uh, input is further augmented by product description, product specification and also question answers. The main input is customer review and the output is a summary but we augment the power of the summarizer using product description, question answers and specifications. Specifications are extremely objective entities. Now we of course publish this work and uh, the reviewers asked us to uh, compare this with chat GPT's output. Here I give an example where uh, a fan's reviews are presented a number of reviews are on the internet. So th the review, what the first review says, not much air comes out of this thing. What does come out only comes out one side. Okay, the language is not fully grammatical and noisy. Another uh, review says the fan takes up very little space, and it can blow in your face when you are sitting down. It will be nice to change the degree of oscillation, but that's a huge deal. Another review says the fan has been bought two months before. Again, the air comes out from one side. The air coming out from one side is a recurrent theme in all the reviews. Now, when we uh, generate, uh, when we look at human generated summary, for example, this one, the f this fan is a great size as it does not take up too much space. However, the airflow does not come out from the middle, rather it comes out from the sides. Because of this, you have to play with the position to get the benefits of the cooling aspect. I would not recommend this for daily use. So th these are human generated summaries. Look at the summary of uh, the chat GPT. This tower fan is disappointing. The recommendation comes right in the beginning. The air only comes out from the side of the vent. This is a recurrent theme in all the reviews, making it hard to direct the airflow. It's noisy and wobbly. So this particular summary seems much more crisp, okay, much more complete and correct. And uh, chat GPT is already giving human beings a run for the money for many natural language processing tasks. Now I would like to uh, show to you our uh, work on uh, uh, machine translation. I'll give you a demonstration of speech to speech machine translation in a number of Indian languages. And I understand multilingual standards is one of the uh, important concerns of uh, BIS. So I'll try some sentences which I've never tried before and I'm always nervous before a demo. So, uh, let's take this sentence. Yeah, so this speech to speech translation. Let's take English to Marathi. AI is changing our life profoundly. AI is changing our life profoundly. AI aplya jivanat pragalbhav badal ghadhun anata hai. This is Marathi. Let me try Hindi. AI is changing our life profoundly. AI humare jivan ko bahut badal raha hai. This is a Hindi translation. Now, let me take a longer sentence which uh, Dr. Obera has said, for example. One of the problems of standardization is ambiguity of language. 
one of the problems of trans standardization is ambiguity of language vishwasaniyatecha samasyan paiki ek mhanje bhashese gnan ek minute let me choose hindi one of the problems of standardization is ambiguity मानकीकरण की समस्याओं में से एक आयाम है ओके एम्बिग्विटी हैज टू बी वन ऑफ द प्रॉब्लम्स ऑफ स्टैंडर्डाइजेशन इज एम्बिग्विटी ऑफ लैंग्वेज वन ऑफ द प्रॉब्लम्स ऑफ स्टैंडर्डाइजेशन इज एम्बिग्विटी ऑफ लैंग्वेज मानकीकरण की समस्याओं में से एक भाषा की समानता है एम्बिग्विटी इज नॉट पिक्ड अपरली सो द आइडिया इज दैट इफ यू वॉन्ट टू ट्रांसलेट एब इन इशियो देन द मशीन आउटपुट कैन बी टेकन एंड इट कैन बी मॉडिफाइड स्लाइटली सो दैट द ह्यूमन एफर्ट इज रिड्यूस्ड नाउ आई कैन ट्रांसलेट इन टू मल्टीपल लैंग्वेजेस मानकीकरण की एक समस्या भाषा की अस्पष्टता है नाउ आई कैन गो फ्रॉम हिंदी टू मराठी सो दिस इज मराठी आई कैन गो टू बेंगली मानकरण समस्या हल भाषार अस्पष्टता ऑल राइट and i can go to assamese ambiguity of language challenges standardization so this is a translation okay and which can be post edited to reduce human effort so these efforts are going on under the bhashini project of meti which is a large scale speech to speech translation project okay so now uh, many of these ai activities have become possible because of large language models and uh, large language models actually do a very simple thing which is that uh, the next word or sentence are predicted or uh, a fill in the blank is done so when fill in the blank is done we use what is called the mass language model so this idea is very simple and uh, the power comes from the fact that large number of parameters are trained for example in the open ai's chat gpt4 system 1 trillion parameters are trained amazon's olympus is planning to train about uh, 4 trillion parameters at a cost of about 4 billion us dollars youtube is developing summarization and conversational ai tools using generative ai so uh, these are very expensive tasks because they need huge amount of data and resources so small and medium language models are also being tried through prompt engineering adapters and fine tuning which are less costly propositions however along with this uh, uh, with this power and large possibilities also are looming in the horizon the problems of bias hallucination hate speech fake, fake news etc and that is taking us towards 
the restraining influence of uh, standardization. Now, some of the well-known large language models are GPT-3, which has 175 billion parameters. GPT-4 has 1 billion. BART is very, very popular, has 110 million parameters. BART large has 340 million parameters. ExcelNet, T5, Llama 2, these are very widely used, especially in natural language processing. And uh, recently, there was a large language model for Hindi called Ho Open Hathi, released by one of the startups called Servam. And uh, Palm by Google was for a long time the largest language model. If you compare these parameters with uh, the number of neurons and connections in human brain, then we see that uh, human brain has about 86 billion neurons and each neuron has on an average 7,000 synaptic connections to other neurons. So that works out to about 700, 600 trillion parameters. Of course, the number of parameters in large language models is much smaller, but this perspectivizes the number of parameters which are used. Now, the data used is in the range of uh, you know, terabytes for many of the large language models. BART, which is a very popular model, ha is trained on about uh, 2.5 billion words from English Wikipedia. And the book corpus, which, is, which has about 11,000 books. So uh, these uh, use huge amount of resource, GPUs and TPUs. And therefore, there is considerable effort at uh, using small language models with knowledge infusion as well as uh, uh, knowledge distillation. Now, some of the small language models are LAMA2, which is 7 billion, FI2 and ORCA from Microsoft, about 13 billion, Stable Bel Beluga, from, uh, which uses Meta's LAMA, is again 7 billion. Then uh, XGen is 7 billion from Salesforce, Alibaba's Quen series, is, uh, uh, has these uh, versions, 1.8 billion, 7 billion, 14 billion, and 72 billion. Alpaca, 7 billion, again leverages meta, meta, and again has 7 billion parameters. MPT, 7 billion, Falcon, 7 billion, and Zephyr is also 7 billion. Now, these are small language models which are adept at uh, solving many natural language processing problems. Now, this possibly gives us an idea that some kind of standard is really emerging. Why this 7 billion is so frequent? Why most of the models make use of 7 billion parameters? Most probably the reason is that the model is not too large, so that you know, uh, resource requirement is moderate, and the model is also not very small, so that its power is not comp compromised. So these kind of trade-offs actually give rise to standards, and I'll not be surprised if these small language models finally say that 7 billion parameters is the standard. So now we come to uh, the need for responsible AI. With power comes responsibility. We are aware of the problems that large language models face. One of the la you know, most serious problem is toxicity. And we know this experience of Microsoft's early chatbot Tay, which was integrated Bing with Bing, and it was shut down. Because when a user was interacting with this uh, chatbot and asked about the movie Avatar, The Way of Water in 2022, released in 2022, the uh, chatbot insisted that the movie was not released at all. The interaction was happening in 2023. When further queried, the chatbot insisted that the current year was 2022 and not 2023. It also called the users stubborn, rude, and confused. Okay? And after this interaction, the chatbot was shut down. We know the problem of hallucination. Google's Lambda responded to a user query saying that a meeting took place between Mark Twain, who won a Nobel Prize in Literature, and Levi Strauss, the gene smuggle. No such interaction actually took place. No such meeting took place. It so happened that both the individuals uh, lived in San Francisco at the same time, 
and uh, uh, Lambda spun a story out of this, this particular incident. So this is an example of hallucination. Then uh, cyber scamming is a very, very uh, serious problem. Uh, video cloners source voice samples from Instagram and calls friends and relatives of victims for uh, asking for money. Okay, so this is a kind of deep fake. Recently we know of an incident where the Honorable Minister of State of Meiti expressed concern when Sachin Tendulkar pointed to a fake video of himself promoting a game. He did not promote any such video. So this was the problem of deep fake. And uh, in China, recreating the dead is catching on. This is for companionship and more. And uh, uh, bias, of course, is a very serious problem on large language models. In our lab, we are working a lot on bias detection. So AI also is filing patents, and there was an uh, attempt by somebody called Stephen Taylor in US, uh, who tried to say that AI-generated uh, creative content also should be patented. So this was ruled out by the US Patent Office, saying that the patent filer can be a human being or, a, uh, or an organization. So these are the problems which uh, sort of dog the large language model area and calls for efforts at uh, standardization and some kind of restraint. So there are many other examples of AI going wrong. Now, under BIS, of course, uh, we are making a lot of effort at AI standardization. And uh, at the national level, LITD30 uh, is the uh, custodian for artificial intelligence standardization. It mirrors the SC42, the International Committee on Standardization. We recognize that uh, the standardization effort should be directed towards you know, bias mitigation, hallucination mitigation, and solving of such problem. So uh, this co committee of LITD30 was constituted in 2017. Uh, without going to uh, the composition, etc., let me specify the documents uh, or the, the panels which are under LITD 30. Uh, levels of specification for AI system, foundational standards, data, trustworthiness, use cases and applications, computational approaches and characteristics of AI systems, testing of AI based systems, these are the panels. The aim of standardization of course has been clarified. Now trustworthiness is uh, the main concern under responsible AI. And we see a number of documents getting created under the umbrella of trustworthiness. So 240293 is for robustness. Then TS6254 is for explainability and interpretability. The next one is on so social concerns and ethical considerations. Then the another is on transparency. Then mitigating unwanted bias in classification and regression. AI systems quality and sharing functional safety, these are all under trustworthiness. And we can see that they go towards responsible AI, which goes hand in hand with large language models. So uh, I'll not uh, you know, list uh, many more activities, but just say that from India, the guideline for AI applications has been uh, accepted as an international standard. This was due to Dr. Srikanth Bhatt from ABB India. And uh, overview of differentiated benchmarking of AI system quality characteristics by Professor Nishit Srivastava from IIT Kanpur is under discussion. So now uh, I would like to end my presentation with uh, some of the uh, efforts of ours in healthcare and underline where standardization will play a role. We have been working on use of AI agents in healthcare quite a lot. The first work is on automatic radiology report generation. Radiologist to patient ratio in India is one is to about 100,000. Compare this to US, this is one is to 10,000. China it is one is to about 15,000. So this uh, stresses the radiologist uh, system of the country quite badly and it needs automation. So the process flow is as follows. The transcriptionist looks at the radiology report the, uh, the radiologist looks at the radiology report and the transcriptionist takes this dictation 
and uh, creates a report which goes back and forth between the radiologist and the transcriptionist and the report comes out. This typically takes one to two days. What we have done is that we have introduced automatic speech recognition to uh, help the transcriptionist and also have used natural language generation to produce the report. So this produces the report in about 15 minutes and is being tried in hospitals in Bombay as a kind of beta study. So this is supported by uh, something called a knowledge graph and that is what I was uh, referring to when I talked about small language models. Knowledge infusion in language models increases their power quite a lot. Now, these knowledge graphs are uh, the knowledge graphs of abdominal organs like stomach, pancreas and so on. But these have to be created very responsibly. These have to be vetted again and again by doctors, radiologists, and then only they should be infused into the large language model. Otherwise, the outcome from decision making of these large language models will be faulty and even dangerous. So knowledge graph construction and large language models decision making have to be monitored and standardized. So this is the knowledge graph of liver and ultrasound. Um, let me uh, go to the next uh, work of ours on mental health support. This is the last uh, piece of work which again requires standardization. In mental health support also we see that uh, there are about 970 million mental or neural disorders in the world and 14.3% of these de deaths, uh, de deaths worldwide are due to mental health problems. Again in India the psychiatrist to patient ratio is about 1 is to 100,000. Clearly this field area also requires automation. So uh, we did some work on this, but we were careful not to prescribe anything, not to prescribe any exercise or medicine. We just wanted to give some kind of you know, positive mental support to a patient which is, who is contemplating some extreme step like suicide. So we collected the data set of counseling between patients and, uh, and the psychiatrist and trained a neural network model which uh, uses both audio, video and also text and then produces the decision. And uh, we produce some you know, pacifying, calming statement for the mental health patient. So this was also published in one of the top uh, conferences. So let me now summarize. We uh, briefly looked at the nature of AI and what AI can do and gave examples of summarization and machine translation. LLMs are extremely powerful and this power needs to be uh, channelized. That is where the role of standardization comes in. Uh, the push for knowledge enhanced LLMs is also growing because not everybody can e train a large language model. So with LLMs we want responsible AI. AI standardization effort is worldwide and uh, LITD30 is also, also contributing to this very, very important effort. We also briefly looked at our effort at uh, AI in healthcare and also mental health pacification. There we have to be particular in uh, standardize, standardizing the data, the models, the learning rate, the hyperparameters and so on. Finally, let me conclude by referring to this uh, picture once again. Uh, AI standardization is really an exercise in trade-off. We should not stifle creativity but we should channelize the AI energy in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bhattacharya, for a very informative presentation. I just want to add one thing here that Dr. Bhattacharya is the chair of LIDT30, uh, LITD30 Artificial Intelligence, which is the National Mirror Committee of ISO IEC JT7 SC42. So we are very pleased to have him with us. So any queries from our participants before we take a uh, tea break? Yeah. Uh, Mike, please. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Bhattacharya, for a very interactive uh, interaction. I have a very small one, small copy. Curie, uh, whether some correlation studies on this LLM and SLM 
throughout this uh, uh, LLM models and people are shifting to the uh, knowledge based SLMs. So, can we have some uh, studies which says that both have the high level, the same level of accuracies which yeah. can expect from the data? Thanks. Yeah, uh, large, there are a large number of papers on many applications. I am aware of mostly the natural language processing applications where small language models, BERT for example, okay, number of parameters are in the range of millions and they have been uh, infused with knowledge from the domain and their, performable, but their performance is comparable to a large language model. I showed you, about, showed you the example of uh, knowledge graph okay, being used in uh, radiology report generation. We are just using BERT which is a medium sized language model and we have compared its output with ChatGPT. ChatGPT uses large language model. So qualitatively we see that our outputs are comparable and in fact ChatGPT falters when it comes to extremely specialized domain knowledge. Okay. Thank you sir. Thank yeah. you for that. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Excuse me. Mic there please. Come forward. So maybe you can ask from there. Sir, just a minute, please. No, maybe you have to use the mic. is not working just just wait for a couple of minutes. how ai will affect the confirmatory assessment system um because uh, in your uh, presentation uh, title of the presentation the standardization confirmatory assessment both are covered right so i don't think i in your presentation, uh, i did not cover confirmatory so that's why i, I i'm not uh, questioning your presentation i'm just yeah. to understand how the AI will affect the existing conformity assessment system. Yeah, um, I, I do not know about how it will affect it, but I can tell you where it can help, okay? So uh, AI systems, especially natural language processing systems are extremely good in matching, okay? The matching algorithms have uh, over last 30, 40 years have reached a level of sophistication which is uh, unforeseen. Now, uh, the matching is also based on uh, probability. Now, you do not give a decision with respect to uh, the, the comparison. You do not give just one zero decision, but you give a probabilistic assessment. Now, large language models actually are extremely good at handling probability. Now, conformity, ass ass conformity assessment, wherever this kind of comparison and matching is involved, I believe large language models will be extremely powerful there and they will be quite fast also. They can cut down the human um, manual effort. Thank you, sir. Yeah. asking actually I'm not able to see you who is asking oh okay yeah yeah hmm. yeah please oh, is it using the AI to this thing? what is the question once again Yeah, yeah, it is totally based on AI. It is making use of what is called neural machine translation. And uh, neural machine translations are uh, trained on huge amount of data. 
they are also now completely large language model based. Thank you, Bhattacharya, sir. Uh, with this, uh, now we, we will have a quick break for tea. I request everyone to join us uh, to uh, the adjust, uh, adjoining hall for the tea, and we shall join back uh, within 20 minutes at 11.40. Thank you, everyone.
All the participants are requested to please take your seats. We are going to resume our technical session. All are requested to please be seated. We are resuming the session. All are requested to please come and take your seats. Welcome back everyone.
So the next session is on from publishing to data management, the future, and smart pilot for authoring OSD, which will be delivered jointly by uh, Mr. Hussein Hadi, head of uh, publishing uh, ISO, and Mr. David Nix, digital transformation officer IEC. A warm welcome to Mr. Nix and Mr. Hadi. Uh, I encourage the participants to please actively engage in discussions and ask questions uh, during the session and even afterwards. So uh, the stage is yours. Thank you. Right. Good morning, everyone. I really enjoyed the sessions early this morning, which really set the scene for that transition and how we leverage the power of technology to change the way we work. So today we're going to talk about the transition from publishing to data management. What does that actually mean? Does it mean that the rise of the IT department takes over all operations? Is there still room for humble editing? Well, the first thing to say is that the future of publishing is about having connections to readers and the knowledge of what those readers want. That is essentially the most important thing that we need to remember. And fundamentally, if we're talking about connections to readers, we're actually talking about leveraging data. Paradoxically, if we want to get closer to our readers, we need clear data. We need usage statistics. So that's ultimately what's underlining that quote. If we want to get close to our readers, we have to understand what are their habits, what do they want. So as consumers of standards, how are they using standards? What do they want from standards? When Shakespeare was writing, he wasn't writing for stuff to lie on the page. He was supposed to get up and move around. He was writing for theatrical performances. The same way we need to remember our standards are there to be actionable, to solve problems, to build a safer, better world. And that's ultimately what we need to remember. We're not writing dry text. We need to bring it to life. And this is what we're asking of technology. To write is human, to edit is divine. This emphasizes the importance of craftsmanship, the importance of helping our committees, our authors, our editors to craft standards that are easy to read, simpler to use, and more actionable. This is essentially what we're trying to do, and this is where SMART comes into play. What is holding us back is perhaps over-reliance on perceiving standards as a publication, as a PDF. Layout is not as important as ensuring the consistency of the content and making sure it solves users' needs. And this is where data management comes in. So we've talked about SMART content. There are many different ways to get SMART content. Each of the activities we've said here are the different Lego blocks, and they're certainly complementary. You could author specifically in a way that captures smart characteristics. You could generate it by natural language processing or other means. Um, you could use programmatic tools, or you could have someone, like an expert, adding characteristics. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about tagging, keywords, metadata. This is where the interplay between classic editing and IT comes into play. And to be honest, the line is blurring. We need editors, we need standards developers who straddle both worlds. And we're very lucky that within IEC, for example, the head editor is really strong in XML and strong in editing. Uh, Alistair, for example, brilliant guy. And you know, we have a really wide set of skills. And that's something that, as all publishers of standards, we need to remember. So if you go back to what we talked about with SMART, if we are wanting to make standards machine readable, as was discussed this morning, how do we do that? How do we transform uh, content into data? How do we go beyond the text to find those patterns that enable us to make use of this information? And as we said before, the foundational aspects of SMART are granular. We break down the standard into specific clauses, into requirements. Uh, we look at the connections between those. These are the foundational aspects so we can reassemble the content. And the value-added aspects of SMART. We need the right context. We need a richness, a semantic enrichment. We need the right metadata. We need to make it easy for a user to just simply type in what they want to find, and we can direct them. We can help them navigate where they need to go, what standards are related, what content is related. A lot of hard work goes into this, and it's, not, it's difficult to make it look easy. 
Uh, Steve Jobs used to say, I want my grandma in Nebraska to be able to use the iPhone. It's similar with standards. We, a lot of firepower goes into uh, the data architecture towards managing the data, but making it easy to use is not straightforward. But ultimately, it comes back to this. The smart is data-driven, which takes us back to that first quote. How do we get closer to our readers? The answer is data. So this is a, an interesting, it's a long journey, and it's not easy. But the good news is, we don't have to do this journey in complete isolation. We are publishers of standards. The publishing houses around the world are going through a similar journey to us, and we can learn lessons from them. So if I'm talking about the publishing industry broadly, I can categorize them in four categories. I could say trade publishing, um, educational publishing, scientific, medical, and professional. In terms of standards, we're quite similar in spirit to the SDM publishers. You know, you have scientific medical publishers, they have uh, uh, peer reviews similar to we do, and they publish highly technical works. Now the difference is, we consider what we produce very practical, sometimes perhaps a bit more academic, but there's still a lot of similarities there. Now this is a, uh, from WIPA, this is a generic publishing value chain. This represents how most publishing houses work, and you can see some similarities with us as standards developers. You have the core you acquire the content, you develop the content, you have project management skills, you format the content, and then you have a commercial and marketing team. And then on the top and the bottom, you have the support functions. You have business strategy and planning, finance, uh, human resource management. So it's not entirely dissimilar from our standards developers. The key difference is in publishing, you always start from the end user, and then the publishing house decides what the strategy is. To some extent, as secretariats, either CS, IEC, we are driven by what the, uh, what the NSPs, what the committees call for. So there's a slight difference there, and hopefully we'll close that loop so that we're being driven by what the NSPs want, what the committees think is the best way forward, but also to make sure that's validated by end user feedback. Once again, it comes back down to data management. So this is a traditional standards development process. Um, you know, th there's similarities there with the classic publishing, the proposal stage, inquiry stage, approval, publication. We are, at the end of the day, a, uh, a publishing house. That's the reality of it. So if we want to move towards a data-driven future, what are the guiding principles that I want to see, uh, my colleagues and I see, what do we want to see? We want to think of content as data. Standards contain actionable content to create a desired outcome. Like Shakespeare, we want our words to dance off the page, to come to life. Technology can help us do that. We want to move towards software as a service. You could even say towards standards as a service, and that changed the way we think. We're not selling PDF, we're not selling by the page, we're selling solutions. Um, Subscription-driven solutions primarily, pay as you go. Data-driven decision-making. As we saw with the dashboard yesterday, this data will help inform how we develop, what products we need, what are our users looking for, what keywords are they using. We need an agile mindset. We need to have the courage to experiment, to move quickly. And we need to make sure that digital transformation benefits all stakeholders. Ultimately, we want to make sure that it's not just people with the resources that can leverage and harness the power of these tools. We want everyone. And we want to learn from other industries, as I'm mentioning with the publishing industry. But we also want to stay true to our values and our goals. So let's take a step back and look at what we can learn from the publishing industry. Publishing industry as a whole had a tough year. Inflation, uncertainty, squeeze on spending. And for any of you, you know, there's, there's, there's a, a decreasing amount of free news information, for example. You can go to BBC News, you can go to The Guardian newspaper, but a lot of people have tried to put a paywall. They're saying you can read the first few articles for free, like Harvard Business Law Review, and then after that, they ask you to subscribe. It's not easy for publishers to uh, transition. One of the comments made by a member of the audience yesterday was digital transformation, one of the negative aspects is that traditional publishers have seen their print revenue dry up and the digital revenue has not risen proportionally. Even though the costs have decreased, they found it hard because we're used to everything free online. You know, you could, if, if, I, if I sell someone a book and I say $25, $50 for a book and I give them a whole library, they'll be happy to pay. If I say pay for a website that has the same content, they're like, it's a website, man. I don't want to pay anything. It's, it's not easy to transition that business model. And of course, publishers have to talk about journalistic values. In the age of AI, in the age, there's a need for authenticity of having a clear voice. As standards developers, we need to make sure the integrity of what we do is not diluted. 
that's important. Mission-based messaging. Guardian newspaper Wikipedia are saying, support us. Our content is free. Can we ask for a donation? This is our voice. This is what we're trying to do. So you can see the publishers are struggling. They're trying to make that transition towards digital business models, but it's not always straightforward. But there are ways through it. Can I add more value to my subscriptions? Let's take the New York Times, for example. They offer different packages that are tailor-made, tailored subscriptions. They might say, this is one level of subscription. Um, Washington Post, for example, they will tailor their subscription depending on the reader's habits. And then they will add value. This is your basic subscription. Do you want to subscribe to the puzzle section, to cooking? As a subscriber, do you want to have a discounted rate to an event, to podcasts? So they've developed a very interesting, uh, flexible approach to subscriptions. And that's something that we can be mindful of. What, can, what is the added value we could add to the core service to help understand standards? So within the publishing industry as a whole, we're seeing that digital transformation. We're seeing the rise of self-publishing. Anyone can be a publisher and make the Amazon bestseller lists um, through Kindle, through otherwise. There's a focus towards personalized subscriptions. Social media is now increasingly important. TikTok can, can add a book to the New York Times bestseller list just by word of mouth, and it's become an increasingly important tool. There's a real focus on diversity inclusion, and of course there's a focus on sustainability within publishing as well. And technology, I can say, and this is reassuring for us as standards developers, are all facing the same challenges and opportunities as we are as developers. They're saying, what tools should I use? Where does AI act as an opportunity? Where does it act as a threat? The, the, the challenges and opportunities are similar. So what are we seeing with this digital transformation? We're seeing the rise of e-books in digital formats, the rise of podcasts, audiobooks, and increasingly flexible micro-subscriptions as well. Uh, when you think of subscriptions, you can think of multiple levels. Subscription could be based on content, could be based on usage, could be based on features. Um, I, I remember in my old company, I launched a product for HR managers, and we priced the subscription based on the number of uh, HR managers, but also on the turnover of the company. So there's different criteria you could use for subscriptions. There's two annual book fairs where all the publishing world comes together. There's the London Book Fair at the beginning of the year, and then there's the Frankfurt Book Fair, and that helps you capture the pulse. And when I attend these conferences, I always feel that the discussions are very similar to what we have in the standards world. AI, what else? Everyone wants to know what's happening with AI. Um, there's an interesting focus on right sales. So, for example, a German publisher, um, they, will they will get rights to translate Harry Potter into German, but they find that a lot of the German readers are impatient, so they order the English version before they fully translate it. So the, so the guys are like, you know what, I'm going to buy, I'm going to secure the English rights to sell in the German market. I'm not going to lose time translating, I'll, I'll get the rights and distribute it myself. So the dynamic there is interesting. TikTok, I mentioned the impact of social media. At the uh, Frankfurt Book Fair last year, they had a Meet the Author event, and they had uh, an interesting podcast. So they're thinking outside the box. Um, what could we learn from standards developers there? Now, if you look at publishing, these are the 10 largest publishers in the world. Um, Relix, uh, was my previous company, has made that transition, the title of our session today, uh, from publishing to data management. They are now more of a IT company than a publishing house. They have 8,000 technologists. The line between IT publishing has blurred, and that has to be the case. We need people that are creative in our teams that have an understanding of data management and have an understanding of product development. So the skills have to be blended now, and that's critical. Um, and we look at and we look at this. Um, the financial model of academic publishers, in particular, has come under pressure. And I'm going to focus on academic publishers because they're similar in spirit to us. Highly rigorous publishing process, bringing together experts from all over to collaborate to produce very trusted content. There's lessons we can learn there. So academic publishing involves making research and scholarly writing available through books, journals, and online portals, similar to us. Authors of these publications generally do not receive direct payment. And there's a controversy, a push to more open research why is this study not publicly available? We get that as standards developers. We get that pushback as well. Common content types include review articles, case studies, etc. And the main sources of income are subscription fees, 
There's paywalls, author processing charges associated with open access. A lot of publishers are experimenting with ways of making their content freely available. The author pays a charge, it's sponsored. There's a hybrid model where it's open to some people and then you pay an additional fee. In the standards world, we have initiatives like Standards Australia has the reader's room where you have non-commercial access. I can read all the standards for free. Some standards are free, others are, you know, but you could see that, that we can rethink our business model. Now with the academic publishers, there's a push towards more open access, but of course that challenges this, the traditional subscription-based model. The growth of preprint servers have impacted publishing. Preprint means that there's almost like a, uh, an early release of the publication um, for people to review it, and that causes issues. Some publishers have embraced hybrid open access models, but obviously piracy and copyright is a concern. Text and data mining can unlock insights from journal articles. What all publishing houses, all companies forget is that they're sitting on a mountain of data. If you can analyze all your publications, you'll find interesting patterns. This is why generative AI has been so compelling, because even if your data is not that structured, it can glean really interesting insights. So we have to realize that we sit on a gold mine of data, and we need to mine that and understand what the secrets that lie within. Future strategies may include more collaborative open access models, transparent pricing, and value-added services. So this was a report that came out um, on trends in academic publishing. And what's interesting, you'll see a lot of similarities with our challenges. Now, they've made a distinction between book publishers and journal publishers. Journals are similar in spirit to standards because it's peer-reviewed and it uh, has a technical audience. Books is quite different to us. I mean, that includes best-selling books like Lord of the Rings and things like that. So let's focus more on journals. What do they consider the most significant challenges? Number one, mo move towards open access, um, a new economic model, and the pace of change. If you look at books, for example, it's more on the economic model, reducing costs, and the pace of change. Those are key challenges. We, uh, publishers were asked, what changes does your organization need to continue to be successful? Journals and books have said operational efficiencies. I need to be more efficient. Um, and then number two for journals is developing open access revenue streams. And number three is discoverability. How do I make sure people know about my content? And this is similar in standards. How do people, we want people to know about our standards. We want them to find out which standards they need, which are more applicable. So you can see there are lessons learned. When it, where is investment most needed? This links to the open session we had yesterday morning. And you can see there most people feel discoverability is the key. This is using the right metadata, making sure that there's search engine optimization, making sure I have outreach programs. How do people know about my publications? How do they use the right, the right ones? Number two, technology-based production workflows. Publisher thinking, how can I be more efficient? Am I going down the XML route? Am I using another way? How do I make sure that I leverage technology to be more efficient in how I publish? This is where the difference between book and, and uh, journals is quite different. What's stopping your organization from achieving its goals? You remember the question yesterday, what's holding us back? Is it a question of technology? Is it a question of investment? Or is it a question of mindset? If you look here, for example, um, for journals, what's the stopping your organization from achieving your goals? Developing a clear strategy, that's what's missing because they almost don't know how to make that transition towards a new business model. It is a tricky one. It's a bit, and what we want to make sure doesn't happen is we don't fall the way of Kodak you know, they were the first ones to look at uh, digital cameras. They're like, but I don't like this because then I won't be able to sell film anymore. And of course, you become redundant because you didn't go with the change. We have to make sure that doesn't happen to us. Um, online access is becoming increasingly important in academic publishing. You know, that's, that's one thing. And then finally, this summarizes some of the key trends. A move towards operational efficiency, rethinking the business model. How can we make that transition to more subscription-based uh, models? How can we be flexible? How can we leverage data in our organization and also leverage data from our end users? How do we get closer to our end users? How do we make sure that our content is used? So to finish all that, this is a nice quote that summarizes it. Publishers are seeking technology solutions to help with product discoverability, and deliver genuine modernization to production workflows. Very similar to us as standards developers. But, and it's a big but, much of the industry is still dancing to a 20th century economic model, prioritizing efficiencies over the world of opportunities offered by digital transformation. 
Meaning, they know they need to change. They want to change. But it's very hard to let go if you're stuck to a very outdated model. You need a complete transformation. You need a complete, a complete rethink. Publishing to data management, to really embed that thinking, it has to happen across the organization. You can't simply say, this is the editorial team, this is the IT team. No, you guys are one team. You need to be working very closely together. That IT guy is just as important as the editor. We are one team. This is something I often have to say in my, in my own organization as well. So back to those guiding principles. This is what we need to do to get where we need to be. Content as data. Moving towards software as a service, standards as a service, data-driven decision-making, an agile mindset. So we start to think of new type of skills we need in our organization. We need product owners, product managers. We need data architects. Uh, we need u user experience people. These are all the type of roles we don't associate traditionally with publishing or even in standards, but this is increasingly important. So we come back to the evolution of standards, what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to move up the wheel from paper to PDF. XML is one of the ways, it's not the only way, as a stepping stone towards more structured content. And I really like the presentation today talking about what we mean by machine-readable standards, but ultimately this is where we're going. And of course, there are different ways to get there. Just going back to what I said before, we need to really rethink how we manage our content at a granular level, modular, finding, uh, making it reusable, finding those connections. This is where we need our data architects to really come to form. We need to think about our taxonomy, how we classify our content. And it's not just an IT issue. We need people in committees. We need editors. Uh, you know, whether it's within ISOCS, within IEC, or whether they're in the technical committees themselves, to think about how they're drafting. How am I tagging? What keywords are going to be used? Have I drafted this consistently? Have I drafted in a simple way? Have I drafted my standard in a way that enables machine readability? At the end of the day, AI is only as good as the quality of the data. So even if we're excited about AI, let's make sure the data quality of our content is clean, is pure, is as good as possible, so the AI tools can work even better. So this is where we add value. And there's different ways, as I said before, of adding value. Is it down to the authors, the people in the committees? Is it about how they structure the content? Should they be adding the tagging? Should they be thinking about it? Should it be the editors who receive the draft from the committees that do that? Should we be using tools and doing that automatically? It's a combination of all three. Sometimes we'll do uh, managing content from the beginning. Sometimes we'll do post-processing. Sometimes we'll automate it. Sometimes we'll get experts to put in the right uh, structuring, the right metadata, the right keywords. We all have to think about it. You can't simply say, I'm just an editor. Nope, we are all managers of data. We are all transitioning. We all want to benefit from the fruits of digital transformation. Uh, which takes us on to the next part of the session, which is, what are one of the ways we could do structured authoring? What role do committee managers have to play? Is it simply that they write their content and then we bring our tech wizards in to transform that content and make it smart? Or do they have a role to play? Can they help us in when, in, when they draft smart from the start? So this is where the online standards development platform comes into play. Hands up, uh, who has heard about the online standards development platform? Oh, not bad. What do you say? That's about half, third. That's not too bad. How many of you have used it or attended demos? Okay, maybe 10, 15, 20. Okay, good. Um, and I'll, 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 I'll certainly welcome your feedback if we have some time. We're trying to wrap up by one on this. So, online standards development. It's a new platform. Where does it sit in the broader strategy? Um, just to say that firstly, we talked about digital transformation. That's the starting point. What is our strategy? Where do we want to go? We need to assess where we are as organizations, as NSBs, as secretariats. What, where are we on the digital transformation journey? And then of course, we want to improve our processes and prepare ourselves to make that transition from publishers to data, um, to data management. We have to improve our existing processes. We need to think about how we categorize, classify, use, and reuse our content, our data, one and the same. 
And then, of course, SMART is the most exciting of all. How do we apply that to, uh, to bring our standards to life, to make our standards actionable? And you can see here, it's all very much interrelated. Make sure that your content, your data is structured, consistent, is clean. Make sure you have the right processes that support that. Make sure that you're rethinking your business model and how we bring that all together. And you can see there that everyone has a role to play from the experts all the way to our sales and marketing teams. They all need to rethink how they work. Um, now, this slide on first glance looks a little bit complicated, but um, if you examine it closely, it reveals the interlink between all this. So on the far left, we have the technical community, we have the technical committees, we have NSBs, we have experts, and they all have a role to play. We need them drafting in a consistent way. Um, and of course, they can draft in multiple ways. We have the online standards development platform. At the moment, a lot of people work in Word. Uh, we have national content. We're going to have smart content, and there's different ways to work with that. Ultimately, we need to balance flexibility with a consistent, structured way. One of the, if you remember, one of the questions yesterday was, why are ISO standards not consistent? Why are there different tables and things? Well, at the end of the day, we do have to give our experts flexibility because we don't want to dictate, you know, oh, you have to have only two column table, you have to do this, you have to do that. We don't want to dictate. At the end of the day, we appreciate these guys are giving their valuable time to us, and we really appreciate that. But on the other hand, we need to be thinking of the end user, and we need consistency. So that's an interesting balancing act. What can help us achieve that balancing act? Um, well, this is where SMART really comes into play, and where the interplay between the SMART program and the online standards development platform can help. So you remember at the very beginning I said, how do we get smart content? It is authored specifically in a way that captures smart characteristic. It's generated by natural language processing. It's taken from an external source or added by a user of a smart system. That could be an expert. It could be an editor further down the road. It doesn't really matter. But ultimately, there's different levers we can pull to make sure that our data can be used and actionable. It can either be done from the beginning, it can be done at the end, it can be done in the middle. But from my perspective, all of us own that process. How do we make sure that the metadata is right? How are we using the right keywords, the right tagging, structuring the content in a consistent way? That we're not just thinking about producing a PDF. We're not thinking about layout. We're thinking about data. We're thinking about data management. We're thinking about standards as actionable content providing solutions to the end users in an easy way. It takes a lot of skill. Um, to make it look easy for the end user. A lot of behind the work scenes, as we saw earlier with taxonomy, classification. So there's a lot that needs to go there. So with that, what is the online standards development platform? I'm glad a lot of you have already ha had a chance to play with it. It's our new platform where experts can start drafting and collaborating from the beginning of the, of, of, of the process of creating a standard. It is a single source of truth. It's a unique platform where all standards developers can contribute to the content of the standards throughout the development process. So we have collaborative authoring. Uh, you know, all experts can come together and can be assigned different roles. You want to draft this particular part. Someone else wants to draft that part. And we all have visibility and we all have uh, the responsibility there. Member commenting. This can all be done online as well in a single platform, a single source of truth, so that you're not passing different documents between each other. You know that everything is recorded, everything is consistent. Comments resolution and consensus building. The idea here is that we're all working with a single source of truth, and that makes it a lot easier. Because at the moment, committees will draft independently using different methods, usually using Microsoft Word, but you know, there's, it, it's flexible. And then the document gets submitted uh, to ISO CS or to IEC further down, down, the, down the publishing chain. But what if we could be working with you from the very beginning, from the very moment we start drafting the standard, you're using it in our platform, we're doing it together. We're helping you format it. You don't have to worry about formatting your Word document in the right way. It's already formatted in the right way. Um, and of course, the editors have visibility of the work of the, of the experts from the outset. We're not waiting at DIS stage to have a look at what you've drafted. We can actually see from the very beginning, and we're all using the same platform. So effectively, we're talking about technology-assisted standards development, integrating it into the ISO and IEC stages. 
automating the directive, assisted authoring, automatically we can say, did you mean this? Um, we, can, uh, this we, can, we can help you with drafting the foreword. You, we can, uh, you can look up related standards. So if you're putting a cross-reference, for example, you say, ah, I'm referring to a related standard. You can look that up and put the cross-reference in straight away. We're basically integrating all the information and creating an ecosystem where we can all collaborate at the same time from the beginning until the end. And of course, you don't have to worry as much about the directives because we've already factored that in into the way we've designed uh, the production workflow. So you don't have to worry about conforming from a format perspective, from an editing perspective. A lot of that is inbuilt. And even if there's any issues, the editors can easily pick that up using the tools within the online standards development platform. Benefits for committees. It's more collaborative. We can all log in. We can all join in. It's more effective. We're all using a single source of truth. It's more transparent. We could see who has changed, what has changed. There's better guidance. We can give you help along the way. Uh, we can make suggestions on what related standards, on what cross-references to put in there. And it's a b overall will be a better experience. But, uh, uh, you know, at the end of the day, this is a big change. We're asking a lot. People love the flexibility of Word. Moving to a more structured way of authoring, in some ways it will involve rethinking. Because at the moment, we're not drafting a document. We're not talking about pages. From the beginning, one of the, th one of the key things about this platform is that it's XML first. You're, whether, you, whether you see it or not, you're actually working in XML from the beginning. We're not converting to XML at a later stage. And uh, for, for us, this, is, this enables, at the moment, where we stand today is that we can enable authoring, we can enable commenting in this collaborative platform. Improve commenting for experts, facilitate consensus building, and sim simplify submission. So at the moment, what's available to ISO committees? You can work in the online standards development platform from prelim preliminary stage, proposal, preparatory committee, and we're piloting uh, the remaining stages. But ultimately, whether you work in the traditional method that you're used to working now, or you're working with online standards development, we're using the same ISO IEC directives. That has not changed. We need to make sure that it's a seamless transition. And it's your choice which platform you want to use. I personally hope that you all at least have your interest uh, whetted so you would like to try it. It is a really great platform and the, beautif the beauty of it is it's an ongoing development. If you say to us, I would like to have a button that does this, please suggest that and we can develop that. It's a work in progress. We want to make it as user friendly as possible and there are so many benefits to be had. And just uh, finally on that point, this is the typical uh, project life cycle of standards, the different stages there. You know, you talk about stage 20, stage 60. Um, we don't need to get into that in too detail. This will be familiar to most of you, but I just want to show you what that looks like from a document perspective. So when we look at the standards development stages from a document point of view, we can clearly see that there is a repeating cycle of authoring, commenting, and comment resolution stages uh, before the decision stage at stage 90. But not all stakeholders need to be involved. Sometimes you'll be you'll be drafting, sometimes you'll be commenting, uh, sometimes you'll just be checking. So we anticipate that in terms of access, in terms of at what point do various people get involved. Um, so you can see here we've, 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 dis we've made a distinction between collaborative authoring, member commenting, comments, resolutions, and consensus building, or read-only, if you know, we, we don't allow changes after a certain stage. But essentially, what we're trying to do is have a single source of truth, assisted authoring. We'll help you comply with the directives because that's inbuilt. We can make suggestions. Uh, document lifecycle within the, within the tool. Functionality changes as the document goes through the development lifecycle. We can decide who has access, who does what. It's a simplified development experience. So if you want to get started, um, we have training sessions on a regular basis, IEC and ISO level. Um, your committee manager can activate that. Um, and we are really excited to get your feedback from those who have used it, from those who haven't yet. But this is a fantastic way to collaborate with experts across the world in a controlled environment that's compliant with the directives um, and that's easy to use. And of course, we welcome your feedback to help us refine and make the, the new online standards development even better. 
So this is just a, to give you a flavor of what it looks like, but essentially it's just enabling us to make that digital transformation to draft content that can be used more effectively um, for the services of tomorrow. So just to finalize on the OSD, uh, it's currently available from pre preliminary through to committee stages. We're piloting the, uh, the rest of the stages. All developers can work collaboratively and efficiently in one place. Access and permissions are driven by the product stage and committee structure. We anticipate when different people need to be involved, who needs to be involved, and we've adapted that accordingly. The online standards web platform is fully integrated within the ISO and IEC ecosystem. Processes, rules, and directives remain unchanged. That's not so, if you're familiar with the way we work now, um, you, you'll, you'll feel at home using the online standards development platform. Committee of, and, of, and officers remain in control of the document at all stages and are responsible to set up project teams, launch commenting phases, resolve comments, and move the project to the next stage. Are we ready? Can we move on to the next part? And of course, we have help and support. You have uh, guidance, uh, suggestions, contact help desk, and this is a big change. We are now involved in helping our authors uh, work from the outset. We're not simply giving advice from the sidelines. We're helping in the drafting process from the beginning. And of course, um, we have a lot of articles. Don't worry, this is just a flavor of the OSD. We have multiple training sessions on a regular basis that gi will give you in-depth training how to draft. We have videos, so please, you'll be able to look at that in your own time. So the OSD is the beginning of the journey towards structured content, more consistent drafting, and making sure that our data is consistent and that we can enable the services of tomorrow. So coming back to SMART, OSD has a long-term benefit for SMART because we're drafting more consistently, we're drafting machine-friendly content from the outset. Um, but that's more of a long-term long perspective. And of course, we have pilots within the SMART program which are very much linked to OSD and to help and have better authoring experience. So with that, I'm now going to pass to David to talk through some of the really good work that's being done and to demo that for you. Great, thank you. There we go, a little better. Um, yeah, so I, you know, I always love this because it's, um, I, I'm, I'm kind of the counterpart to Hussein, he's the, the publisher and, and of course, Experts and TCs are critical relative to the development of smart content and to thinking about it from a data management perspective. At the same time, though, the value of smart is going to be to improve our TCs and our authors' um, experience. It's going to make it more efficient. And so, for example, when we talked about how we are taking content and turning it into modular, reusable components, Imagine one of the biggest challenges that we have today is the application of terminology across all of the different standards and the consistency for that. Imagine if we can easily add in terminology and make sure that it's consistent and reused, if we can suggest that to our authors while they're authoring in line. So a lot of what we did the smart pilots from last year was not only focused on how do we ask authors to develop content that will be smart, but also how do we use that content to enable authors to be more efficient, to be faster, and to ge generate higher quality content from the outset. Some of the pilots that we've done, and let's hope this, oh, you're gonna have to turn this back on for me, it's locked, sorry. Um, I have really focused on how can we embed capabilities back into OSD, what are the future um, features that we want to see in OSD and how might that work. And so from the SG-12 work that was done last year within the IEC, we crafted a pilot that begins to show what OSD might, or what SMART might look like embedded within OSD. The ability to create a SMART view of our standards and preview tables that can be embedded into our standards rather than authoring those from scratch. The ability to look up and tag content so that it is automatically incorporated using AI, but also using data that's been generated from 
pre prior authoring um, of standards. So all of this is headed towards a place where we can continue to improve the authoring experience and generate higher quality content and data. But it's also not just about international standards, right? I think our focus last year was primarily on international standards, the PDF, the XML content that we have. How do we manage that? How do we create that as smart standards? How do we do that in a more efficient fashion? However, we also know that it's not just PDF content, that it's not just international standards that we need to be focused on. And so this year, as we continue to move forward, we know that there are digital components or code components that are already either being authored as part of standards today that don't have the right tools or the necessary support in order to really generate them the way we want to, or it's new code components, it's architectural diagrams, it's process diagrams that need to be embedded into our standards that we need different ways of managing that authoring process and the tools to support that and the relationships back to our requirements. I think at the end of the day, one of the things that we'll see this year happening quite a bit is there will be a theme that is focused on interoperability of content. Not just across IT and ISO content, obviously that's important, obviously that's something that we're going to continue to focus on. Not just in the, the use of terminology and ontologies to link content across diff from different sources, but also how do we maintain those relationships to national content, to national standards? How do we enable our members to integrate and make sure that national content is interoperable with international standards? That you can actually find the sustainability requirements from ISO, IEC, and the Indian specific requirements all in one search. How do we do that and make that easier for our end users, our industry, our conformity assessment, test, test labs, et cetera? So we'll continue to do a tremendous amount of piloting this year, and we'll continue to focus on how do we improve the experience for authors. Um, the work that we did last year is getting incorporated and thought through as part of the OSD roadmap. We certainly know that OSD is important to where we're going in the future. We also understand there are other content sources that we need to incorporate into the future of SMART. I think a couple of the other pilots that Hussein's gonna talk about were run from our national committees, um, AFNOR and DIN, to touch on how they've looked at authoring and some of the interoperability that we're trying to explore this year. So the, the, the beauty of the, the SMART program generally is that we're bringing together committees, we're bringing together NSBs, we're leveraging the collective expertise, creativity, and power of everyone here. And we're rethinking how we draft standards. Like I said, from the beginning to the end, what's the role of AI? What's the role of the authors in drafting the right content? And OSD is an important part of that. But related to that, um, there's some excellent pilots going on within the SMART program, which are certainly helping. And I'd like to thank AFNOR, our colleagues in France, uh, for the building information model that they're working on. Because what they're ultimately trying to do here is to try to make it easier for people when they're drafting from the beginning. This is about terminology. This is about consistency. We, we want to create a dictionary to better understand how enrichment could be made. We want to understand how users could use a data dictionary. We want to challenge the enrichment done during phase one. We want to start identifying main usage and related content that should be made available. This is ultimately about making drafting more consistent, about avoiding duplication, about making it easier and more consistent when people use different terms. So this is just one of the pilots, and it's related to a similar pilot within ISO, where we're looking at terminology. You heard yesterday from our colleague in Germany that there's a lot of duplication, something like 90 different versions of the word risk um, across domains, across industry sectors. This is something that we recognize that different words have different interpretations per industry, per jurisdiction, but ultimately we want to avoid some of the unnecessary duplication. We want to make it easier for people to know what other committees are doing. We want to make it easier uh, for, for that consistency. And the AFNOR pilot, um, which is progressing really well, 
is looking at how stakeholders can get involved in the construction sector and looking at specific methodologies within the construction sector. Um, so this is a very targeted industry-driven pilot and it'll be very interesting to see what impact that has uh, within how we work in the OSD and what impact that has for future smart services. Uh, our DIN pilot from our colleagues in Germany, uh, this is more of a plug-in uh, directly into the OSD and we're looking at requirements. Remember that one of the pilots we talked about yesterday in terms of end user benefit is requirements extraction. What if we start talking about requirements from the beginning of the process? What does that actually mean? Um, just to make people familiar, uh, the OSD, uh, part of what OSD is based on is a tool called Fonto, so that's why you've seen that mentioned here. And you've talked about XML editing. As I mentioned before, the OSD uh, is, work, is, XML, is an XML first authoring platform. So when you're drafting an OSD, immediately you're generating consistent XML. So rather than the traditional process where I draft in Word, then I convert to XML, it's an XML first authoring platform. So that's just to make you familiar there when we talk about XML and when we're talking about Fonto, which is the tool underpinning the online standards development platform. Um, and requirements management is ultimately what it's all about. This is very important. This is the, the core of, uh, of a standard that makes it actionable, that makes it uh, implement, uh, able to be implemented. And this pilot is ongoing and you could see there some of the key uh, sectors involved and some of the key uh, industry players that are supporting this pilot. So my thanks to our colleagues in Germany from DIN and our colleagues in France from AFNOR for being involved. There are a lot of other pilots and within the SMART program we're always open to pilots that are coming directly from NSBs or from industry players within those jurisdictions. So in conclusion, we want to help accelerate that transition across the wheel you see here, moving from paper PDF towards machine readable standards. Um, which comes back to that discussion at the very beginning of this morning where we were talking about what does that actually mean? How can we integrate standards into industry workflow? How can we have real-time monitoring? It all comes down to how we draft and how we ensure consistency. So with that, uh, we have some time for some comments or questions, unless David, you'd like to add anything at this stage? Okay, if, we could, if you wouldn't mind having the mic, um, and also if uh, Mara or, uh, has any Anything to add? Or Jill, no? Okay. Uh, can we have a mic over here, please, at the front? license version we've signed that we have a direct arrangement um, yeah. and we need and we needed that to have control and to customize it so we've licensed that tool yeah can you share the details with uh, BIS? Ab absolutely um, you know there are there are colleagues within BIS that have started using the online science development platform we would actively encourage that so we will be delighted to do a workshop with you take you through it and give you access anyone that it's within the IEC ISO ecosystem has access to that yes, it's freely we, we make it freely available to all committees No, it's, it's covered under the existing arrangements we have. When, as, like I said, the ISO IEC directives still apply. So when you're contributing to drafting a standard, it's the same process that applies. You need to make sure that it's original content. If you're getting permission from elsewhere, you have to secure the copyright. The same principles apply. The only difference is you're using this uh, for drafting. In fact, it's more ISO IEC compliant because you're entering the ecosystem at an earlier stage with a single source of truth. So, yeah, it's covered under existing arrangements, um, and yeah, we, we'd be delighted to get you guys involved. Thank you so much. Yeah, so, so uh, I'm a little concerned about the smart standard that you were uh, in the slide. The number two, point number two was about creating the content through natural language processing and all that kind of thing. So, that's where I'm a little concerned that if we 
I will say the first thing is those are different ways you could generate smart yeah. content and we're not necessarily saying that you have to use a particular one. We're just saying the different ways it can be done. But we completely share your concern here. At the end of the day, we never want to dilute our brand and we want that content to have gone through the rigorous process that we have in place, adhering to our guidelines, adhering to our style guides, etc. So that's not going to change. Um, we're actually ha running an AI session later today where we talk about the specific use cases where AI might come into play. So this could be, and David will talk about this later, suggesting what word you might want to use. Did you mean this? Um, helping with tagging. We don't, and we don't ever anticipate that we will use AI for actual drafting. I mean, that, that, ha that, that will not happen. It's to help assist people with research to assist them to draft accurately, but we certainly don't want any content to be created by AI. That's not what we want in any way. I don't know, David, do you want to add to that? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think, that's, I think that is the, the case, and I think that you know, we're going to talk about this a little bit later this afternoon, but uh, all of our experience with AI, with NLP, with generative AI right now is pointing to the fact that it can be a great assistant. However, it requires our experts, our expertise, and our organizations to be involved in making sure that what it produces is real, is val validated by IEC, ISO. Um, and so we don't see letting loose AI on our ecosystem right now. Um, I think at the same time, there are a number of initiatives going on around um, Within the IEC, for example, there's an SMB ad hoc group 96, which is also looking at the governance of AI within TCs and across standardization. Um, so I think there's a lot, of, a lot of runway for us. That being said, certainly using it as suggestions and to make things more efficient um, and, and to help assist our experts is clearly where we're headed. Um, and we just need to be careful. Now, I may differ a little bit from, um, from Hussein, you know, to say, I, I don't know that I would say never. I, I mean, you know, I think three months ago I would have said, no, it can't. Now I'm like, well, it kind of can. So, I mean, three years from now, who knows what it's going to do. But I think the important part of no matter what it is, is that we can't lose, and we were just having this conversation at the tea break, we can't lose the human aspect of being involved, one way or the other. If we lose that, then you know we might as well just you know, move to Mars with Elon. So, so it's not about human uh, touch or the thing. It is more, more about leveraging the wisdom of the human because AI can give us intelligence, but not the wisdom which everyone you know uh, develops over a period of time in different contexts. And global expertise in global standards is all about. Leveraging the wisdom, not this thing. And if we allow them to, you know, uh, feed in uh, content created by AI, I'm sorry, I think we'll be defeating the very purpose of global standardization. That's my only concern, nothing else. I, so I, I'm happy to use the AI as a support tool. No, no, no questions on that. I'm, I'm going to say a controversial thing that uh, we often say in the legal sector, which is AI won't replace lawyers, but lawyers that use AI will replace those that don't. Does that apply to standards as well? Maybe it's too early to say, but ultimately we're just saying use the tools to be better at what you're good at. You know, Thanks. Yeah. Just a further cl clarification on the question asked by my colleague on the use of that OSD tool. Like when we adopt, like take up some international standard for adoption as Indian standard, then we have to share it with our experts, they comment on that. So at that point of time, can we make use of this OSD tool at national level for 
like uh, using that tool to evolve the national standard out of that international standard. Or from the beginning only if you want to, from the scratch only if you want to write some Indian standards. So can we make, uh, is there a provision that we can make use of that OSD tool? It's a very good question. At the moment, it's only done at the ISO IC level, although we anticipate um, rolling that out in the future to be used in national adoption. We're not there yet because we're still developing the tool, but if there is a uh, demand for that, then certainly we would like to explore that possibility. Um, one thing we will do, which is, a pl which is helpful here, is that any members that are comfortable using XML, the, XM, the quality of the XML we produce from the online standards development platform is very high, and there's a lot of customization there. So to give you an example that is close to my heart, um, you know, half the world uses the decimal comma, others use the decimal point. India, of course, uses decimal point. And in, in Indian standards, there's, a, a, there's a, a statement that always makes me sad, which says, but please note that ISO has, and IC have used the comma, we use the decimal point. What I would like is that using the OSD, we can apply the right tagging so that when you get the XML, you could quickly use it to make sure that you have decimal point throughout. Now, that's something that can be done in the medium term. In the long term, I would like you to be able to use the OSD as well. I don't know if our senior team have anything to add to that. Well, the, uh, the only other thing that I would add to it is, is just to also say that um, when we look at where we're going, I think national adoption is a really important part of uh, smart standards and how that's going to be incorporated into use in specific markets and what is the interoperability of nationally adopted content with nationally created content and how we manage that interoperability across that. I think the challenge that we also have is that across all of the different markets is slightly different in each market and so how do we adapt that to those market specifics. I do think at the end of the day, this has to be a member-driven approach to how we make sure that our members can drive value through national adoption and through the content interoperability. I would just add to that, I asked the question yesterday, do you feel that across the world there should be consistency in how people draft? Now, the answer was very much moving towards yes, which makes it easier, because as David rightly said, people have very unique resourcing, they have unique uh, style, they have unique formatting, as long as they adhere to our, to our guidelines, to our directives, they have that flexibility and that freedom. If we want to move towards a more harmonized, consistent approach, then that can be done. But obviously we don't want to step on anyone's toes. But if there is a will, then certainly we could have harmonization. I think the OSD is a good way to move towards that perspective. I think that would be really helpful if you think of uh, making the things available in that direction. Thank you. Thank you. That's really nice to hear. Great. <laughs> Maybe, do we have time for one more question or? Uh, can I just ask a question? Yeah, I'm S. Basu from BS. So uh, I'm uh, from Eastern Regional Lab of uh, Bureau of Indian Standards. So as a uh, laboratory using uh, standards, what we feel is a basic problem is that the development of specifications for equipments mentioned in the standard. So does your OSD tool have some provision or will be having a provision wherein the specification of the equipments uh, detailed there in these international standards can be drawn out more, more easily? The short answer is no. However, we are open to that. At the, we're still at the development stage. If that's something that could, we could consider that, at the moment it isn't in the, in the immediate roadmap, but I don't see why not. Are uh, we okay for one more question or over there? Sir. Oh, please. Thank you. I'm Abhishek Pal from BIS. Okay? And my concern was same as, I mean, we should limit the AI content in these standards. I mean, when we were reviewing some papers or journals from few conferences, then we got to know that, I mean, I mean, AI content is not encouraged in this, I mean, when we are writing papers or journals. And when we reviewed that, we got, we found that there is some 20% AI generated content or 30% AI generated content. So that we can limit or we can, I mean, remove. And also, uh, in OSD platform, we should have plag plagiarism check also, that uh, from where it is, the content is being drawn into, into the standard. And the third point is, since we are making standards and, and various other standards, I mean, I'm talking about inter-standard, uh, I mean, uh, interoperability. I mean, when we are writing any standard, when we are writing any requirement, 
the other standards uh, should get alert or something so that uh, with, uh, in with uh, the requirements getting changed. So we can think of this uh, in the this platform. And also, I mean, for machine interpretable standards, can we make, I mean, in the standards, can we make like some checklist sort of things like what is mandatory or non-mandatory content when we are, I mean, implementing this, these standards in uh, uh, mostly in certification these are all very good points. There's four of those, so I'm going to try to answer quickly. The first one in AI, we are very cautious. We are excited about the potential of AI, but we're taking a very cautious, careful approach. Um, and, and at the end of the day, the use cases are very specific. You know, for example, uh, we're talking about research. We're talking about using it to help with discoverability. But I feel we can discuss that later today. We've got a session on AI and standards specifically. Um, the beauty of the OSD, if you're talking about where the content came from, is that all the drafting, all the collaboration happens in the OSD from the outset. In that way, it's more secure than waiting for committees to collaborate between them and then submit a document. The fact that they start drafting from the beginning is more secure, is more, uh, shall we say, within the, the, within the framework. It, it makes it easier to comply with the directives. So we're not looking at a Word document and checking that it complies. There's already a degree of, uh, of, of compatibility by the fact that you've drafted in the OSD. So that, that will ensure more consistency. Um, in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of uh, the point you made, that's very much linked to SMART. How can we, uh, how can we have those, th those connections, that, you know, uh, those links between different documents? And that's a key use case there. And that's why it's important, the classification of the data, the taxonomy, um, having those cross references, so that's critical, and that's a key part of SMART. Would you add anything to David? There we go. Um, yeah, I, I think one of the points that you made was a little bit about transparency, right? How do we make sure that we're alerting different technical committees, different experts around which requirements or standards are changing so that they can be aware of that, they can incorporate those changes into it. We actually also see that use case from an industry perspective as well as industry and test labs are adopting requirements and implementing those into their products. They want to know if those are changing. They actually want to be able to see the impact analysis of a changed requirement and how that proliferates through their products and their models and then understand what they need to change. I think there's a question which becomes how early are we comfortable giving people insight into changes? And I think today we err on the side of not letting people have access into things that are changing until it is past a certain authoring stage, past a certain voting stage, et cetera. Maybe we need to rethink how much visibility and transparency we want to provide into content that is changing and how we would manage that. I think it's a, a really great and important question. I think it's a, a need in the industry. I think it's a need from our authors. And I think we're going to have to, to solve that problem sooner or later. And from a very simple perspective, within the USD, if you're, while you're drafting, if you're referring to a related standard, you will actually look that up on our database. So you could see the most up-to-date version. You could see related standards. So it's a lot easier to insert those cross-references. And we often have interesting debates. Should we allow someone to put a standard that is no longer uh, in force. And um, th there are some cases where you would do that, which uh, I found quite strange, but we did find use cases where that might be the case. But the beauty of the OSD is it's all integrated. So when you put it, when you insert a cross reference, you could see exactly what is applicable, um, what are the different versions. So it's all there. And if you tell us that there's a different use case, we can add that to the future roadmap as well. I think we should let our, our colleagues. Uh, for the next presentation. Yeah. There's, there's one more question, please. Yeah. Uh, uh, in the OSD, the members would be contributing their uh, R&D data, some justification for the content that has to be added in the standard. So once the standard is made, would that R&D data or the research or the justification for putting the particular requirement in the standard can then be extracted later on when the standard is made by the members who are using it? It's a very good question. I mean, that's a decision to be made for the future roadmap of the OSD. At the moment, at the, moment uh, the justification, the background isn't, but it would be very easy to have that as a feature. Um, it, it comes down to a policy decision. Is that something we want to do? But it's technically very doable to do something like that. It's not there at the moment, but we could 
in theory. And this is why we need everyone to participate in OSD, to get your feedback, to help us refine it and develop it. Um, so, uh, but I don't see why not. I mean, you know, we're, we are constantly evaluating who applies the tags, who applies the keywords, how we should structure, what parts should we allow to be altered, what not. So it's a constant evolving process, but we're open to it. I think it's a, it's a good idea. Well, and I think, it, I think it goes back to the original premise of the entire discussion. As we move from content to data, and then we start actually having data from requirements, from guidelines, from national content, the question just becomes, how much data is enough? And so as we continue to find all these different sources and incorporate this into this massive you know, body of data that we'll all have access to, where do we stop? And, and I, that could be a really difficult question for us in the future. Maybe we're capturing data that's not necessary, but as long as we can capture the data and it has an end use, I think the value of that at the, in the end is going to be um, important for us to maximize. And SMART itself is raising interesting questions about the future of even the directives, because the directives were often were drafted um, in a pre-SMART, pre-AI world. And obviously, we, we constantly update them, but there may be changes long-term that we recommended from the outcome of the SMART program that change what is our digital editorial policy? What is future deliverables? What does a future standard look like? Do we include an algorithm alongside the standard as an electronic insert? Um, is the standard no longer a PDF? I mean, these are some big questions that need to be answered very carefully, and we're looking at those. Um, but with that, just want to say thank you very much. We'll talk about AI after lunch, but let's keep the discussion going. Um, yeah, cheers. Thank you, Mr. Hadi and uh, Mr. Nix. I must compliment that your sessions are always very, very interactive and uh, lots of participation we get to see from uh, the participants. Thank you once again. Moving forward, we have with us Mr. M uh, Matla Hale uh, Solomon Peter from South African Bureau of Standards to talk on digital strategy of SABS. Uh, Mr. Martle Hale Solomon Peter has 20 years of rich experience in SABS and is currently working as manager for uh, standards development processes and support at SABS. Mr. Peter is a member of uh, Standards Management Committee of the African Organization for Standardization, ARSO. He is former member of Southern African Development Com uh, Community Standardization Arm and Executive Committee as well. So, a uh, warm welcome to Mr. Martle Hale Solomon Peter for his presentation. So, please start. All right. <coughs> Thanks very much, uh, Program Director, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we feel very honored to be invited to this session to also share our experience and what we are doing. And I must say to the leadership of BIS that we really find this workshop very, very interesting and we might want to do exactly the same thing uh, in our own country where we conduct the same, the same workshop. Thank you. Yeah, and maybe even just taking from the last presentation or just the last session, you know, when one is sitting there, you're wondering, what will be the skill set of the future editor? Because most of us currently, when we recruit editors, we're looking for linguists. So somebody who is specialized in languages, uh, that's the person we're looking for. Maybe in future, I'll say, in addition to that, you need to have IT skills as well, as we are going through this this transition. So I'll be very brief. I've been given just 15 minutes uh, to go through this presentation. Just as a way of introduction, uh, introducing, uh, introducing our organization uh, as the South African Bureau of Standards. We are an agency of the Department of Trade, Industry, and Competition in the South African uh, context, established in 1945, but currently operating under the Standard Act of 2008 with a primary mandate of developing, promoting, and maintaining South African national standards 
a promotion of quality with respect to commodities, products, and services for the domestic and export markets, as well as providing com com conformity assessment services, which will include certification, testing, inspection, and verification. <coughs> Our focus is more on standard development as a primary mandate, uh, and most importantly, we do provide access to both the national standards and international standards, and obviously in addition to our commercial operations, which is our laboratory services, local content verification, uh, consignment inspection, and so forth. <clears throat> Just very briefly on our, our objectives, strategic objectives, uh, which I'll focus just on one that is aligned to the workshop or the theme of the workshop. Uh, where when we develop, we promote and increase the use of standards, we say through our ICT objective and strategy, we are aiming at optimizing an automotive processes and system that will enable uh, smart deliverables. Uh, we're also looking at uh, automating our business operations, seamless integration, enabling innovative business solution, uh, digitally enable SABS operations to demonstrate our return on investment. So this will then you know, cover our objectives underpinned by our ICT strategy and objective. <coughs> now, uh, Program Director, yesterday there, were, there was a session that was very interesting where we are always saying that you know, it does not help to come up with strategies when you don't know what your customers require. You know, what, what is that that your customer needs? So instead of looking in internally, we also had to then ask our, our customers what is that that they require. And they listed some of the things. One very important, timely delivery of publications and solutions. And I know when we speak to some of our counterparts, some of our peers, they were already said, as soon as we implement this uh, digitization strategy, you will see that even the time to deliver your standards get drastically reduced. So that, I think, will then respond to the first thing that is our customer requirement. Affordability of publications. This came up, I think, yesterday in one of the sessions as well, where there's always this view that standards are expensive. And I must say, I don't think it is entirely incorrect. I think to some extent it is correct. I did give an example to say if you take from you know, our collections, one standard maybe to do with the building regulations or the application thereof. So I want to buy one part of the building regulations or the building standard that support the regulation. That document will make reference to about 20 normative references because we always say you, know, you, you can't duplicate the requirements in standards, you must cross-reference. So you go to the cross-reference, it refers you to another standard. So at the end of the day, instead of, say, paying 500 rands for that copy of the standard, you end up paying maybe three times that, four times that. So when the customers say we want affordable publications, we are now saying that wouldn't it be easier that maybe I'll sell you the standard or I'll give you access to the standard. But then in addition to that, those that are supporting it, depending to what extent they support the primary standard, then I give you access to the data or that reference in those standards. In that way, we are saying we might actually uh, successfully respond to the requirement expressed by our customers. Simplified yet effective collaboration. Obviously, we, you know, we've heard of the OSD, and we believe that you know, this will also assist us to respond to our uh, customers' needs. Ability to participate and contribute remotely, same thing, would apply effective management and porting of projects, timely communication, access of content through apps, seamless end-to-end -end development and delivery of solutions, as well as segmentations of solutions aligned to industry sectors and requirements. So currently we do, obviously, this is something that we are also looking into. Where would then package standards? We'll say we've got a collection of, our, of about 7,500 standards uh, where, you know, as, as, as a customer, we can give you access to all of those documents. Or we can package them for you, we can pre-select for you to say, if you are in the energy sector and that's your interest, we will say to you, these are the standards that would then address your standardization needs or provide you with, with those solutions. So these are some of the things that we are saying. Our customers say, this is what you require, and we need to, through digitization, respond to them. 
Uh, I will also then just quickly go through what we currently have. You will notice that <clears throat> the colors are not that clear, but the red one says this is something that we have to work on. So in the interest of time, I'll just highlight the important ones. So the first thing is that obviously our, our, our website, that's where we promote and we market our standards and we do other things like our public inquiry, that's a portal that we do that. But under our standards library and the drafting, so one of the things that we're looking at is this XML formatting of documents or where we draft documents based on the XML. We want to still uh, uh, do the e-publishing of standards on the, our customer relationship management. I've touched on that as well, but we've marked this as red because that's something that we're working on, contract management, reporting tools, and other things like event management. Uh, when I jump quickly to my left-hand side on the project management, we do have, you know, we, as I said, program director, we were established in 1945. So some of the tools that we still have were kind of like designed internally. We had IT people designing these tools, like Substan. You know, yesterday when we were listening to how, you know, with this smart transition, you can search through keywords and so on. This tool that we call Substan that was internally de developed, you know, it is able to fulfill some of these functions, but here's the challenge with these internal develop, develop tools. Now we've got new IT people, young people who are running our IT sector, our, or our department, technicians, and every time we ask them to make amendments to this tool, they will tell us that this tool was built on old Oracle forms and we don't understand them. So please don't ask me what is that, but that's the answer that we always get from them, that we don't know how to deal with this thing. Uh, so we were looking into uh, replacing that. Then obviously the main thing being smart deliverables, which is now where we are trying to look into. Obviously there'll be kind of some challenges that we're still dealing with. I'm not gonna go too much into details, but you know, the issue, is maybe the, one of the reasons why I'm asking you the questions, the skills and digital literacy of our staff. We do have editors, but when we now start talking about these other things that really, really require to understand something about ICT, will they have that? Uh, then obviously other challenges are more, more internal, but this is the one that responds to the theme of today. So this picture, it was there just now, uh, but we just wanna show you where we are at the moment as the SABS. Uh, unfortunately, we are still at the paper and PDF format of documents, that's what we deliver. And our target is that by the end of this year, we should have at least transitioned to XML, whichever way. I know other countries have said we had 24,000 standards and we're able to migrate all of them uh, from the old PDF format into the XML format. We don't have too many publications. We've got seven and a half thousand standards and I think we should be able to achieve this. If not, obviously we will we will finish the project come next year. Uh, we're also saying that we have to also leverage on ISO and IEC smart programs. So that's why, uh, uh, Chairperson, I'm saying this workshop is also very, very interesting to us as we are looking into this. The case studies that we exist, we will then also look into them. Then, you know, on my left hand side, just to demonstrate the kind of committees that as, a, as, as, as an NSP, we are participating in your, your DEFCO Smart Working Group, ISO, IC Smart Steercom, ISO CPEC, and ITSEC. That's where we are. So we have not made much progress, but this is why we are working on something. So obviously these are just some of the committees that we participate in. So this is just a summary now, Chairperson, of our strategy. Uh, of what we've said is that first thing is that you need to stabilize what you have. You also need to then start enabling, you know, this digital transformation or migration. Then you have to transform, uh, uh, obviously, your whole operations. So on the stabilization part, we're looking into people, processes, data information technologies uh, to enable us this seamless integration to reduce business outages, to provide intelligent data-driven or what they call big data decisions to introduce programs to improve digital literacy. On the transformation part, which is now our long-term project, we want to transform our SABS business model to realize digital enabled quality assurance organization. Uh, then just, just 
to give you the time frames, you know, we've got a number of programs that we're gonna run with from year one <coughs> for the third year, year three. Uh, very important point that was made, you know, our leadership, executive leadership will always ask a question. So, okay, we can see all of these programs, but what impact will that have on our revenue? So if you say you're gonna give people instead of giving them, selling them the whole standard, you're just gonna give them access to data, one paragraph from the standard. How is that gonna impact on our revenue? So we are saying that with all these programs, we need to also uh, 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 think of you know, making our organization also sustainable. So a number of projects, we've color coded them to show you that when, when I speak about stabilizing, which ones do you want to stabilize? Obviously, Substan I've spoken about, we want to replace that, we want to improve our business process re-engineering and mapping. Uh, we want to stabilize the upgrade of enterprise content management, where we want to enable. We also have a number of programs that we want to enable. But all of this, as I keep repeating, we want to be able to, to, to to move and migrate from where we are into uh, realizing our digitization as an organization. So in conclusion, Chairperson, we as an organization, we are saying we want greater involvement with ISO and IEC on the smart program, so we'll be taking you up on that. Uh, we don't want to reinvent the wheel or sometimes to develop our own systems internally because at some point, they catch up with you that you left behind. Our customers are key to facilitate decisions on investment and digitization. I've already spoken about that. It doesn't help to do run with programs that are internally focused and they don't respond to your customer needs. The case studies and sharing of experience amongst the NSPs. Obviously, we develop at different paces. There are those that are way ahead of us. There are those that have not even yet started some of this. So this working together as the standardization community is very important for us. And then transition to smart is inevitable. We can't, uh, I mean, yesterday that there was a very tricky question asked in terms of AI, whether it is now, in a year's time or so. And from our point of view, we are saying that uh, we believe that we are even a bit late as the SABS, given our history, that we've always been there in the forefront with everybody else. Uh, let me thank you very much. I would like to pause there. Uh, thank you, Mr. Peter, uh, for the insightful presentation on the digital strategy of SABS. And now we will break for the lunch. And we would uh, request our uh, dignitaries and participants to come back at 2 PM, because we have lots to catch up. Thank you, everyone. मानक बनाते हैं और मानकों के माध्यम से जीवन में गुणवत्ता के प्रति
gentlemen. We are going to start the post-lunch session. All are requested to please come back to your seats. participants in the dining area are requested to come to the to their seats this post lunch session is going to be very interactive Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back after this lunch. Now we are going to start our next session on how can technical committees prepare for the digital future. For this, I have the pleasure of inviting on the dais our eminent dignitaries, uh, Mr. Vimal Mahindru, IEC Vice President and SMB Chair, Mr. Jill Thornet, Deputy Secretary General, IEC, Ms. Mara Rolando, Head of PMO, ISO, Mr. David Nix, Digital Transformation Officer, IC. Mr. Hussein Hadi, Head of Publication, uh, Publishing, ISO. I am sure we all are eager to hear how the conventional technical committees will gear up for the smart standardization and uh, what ISO and IC are planning to upgrade these technical committees for the smart standard formulation. So uh, I'll just hand over uh, the session to Mr. Vimal Mahindru. He is going to chair it. Thank you very much. Uh, can, you, can you hear me loud and clear? Is there echo today or uh, that's history? 
Thank you very much. Uh, do I have everybody's attention? Do we need to warm up again? Show me your hands. Everyone. First of all, with our same hands, we're going to give a round of applause to the panelists. You know, since yesterday morning, they've done a great job of bringing us from the world to India to OSD to a lot of things which are about the digital future. But how do you trigger change? How can technical committees really gear up for the future? We all know, and I think by now, after one and a half hours of this, uh, one and a half days, sorry, of this kind of uh, discussion on digital transformation, I'm sure you will all agree that we are convinced that the future is digital. But given that the future is digital, what does it mean? And what does it mean to be successful in this uh, digital future? That's the question here. We have about 30 minutes. Like last time, this is going to be highly inter interactive today also. And uh, I'll be asking some questions to the panelists, but also coming back to you in the audience for your comments and thoughts. My first question, amongst all of you, how many of you have personally worked in any technical committee or a sectional committee or a panel in BIS or in any other committee in terms of getting consensus done and writing a standard. Just show me, give me a show of hands. That's pretty good. So you have a very uh, knowledgeable audience. So, and I hope this can be interactive and also challenging the panelists with some of the questions. So my first question to you, you know, you've uh, been uh, uh, you know, at this cutting edge uh, in IEC and ISO of digital transformation and this whole digital journey. From your impression, what do you think works really? You know, each one of you, you know, one or two, the top two, three things that you have seen, you know, which have worked and uh, uh, which uh, you've seen and I realize that you've been in many different uh, national committees and countries to have similar uh, digital transformation workshops. What has been some of the learnings from there and also at the, the headquarters? Uh, you know, David? Great, thank you. Um, you know, it's, the, the, I guess my perspective is a little bit of an outsider to, uh, to this because I, I haven't been an expert in technical committees and I've, I've come into the IEC and, and I've really been a champion for digital transformation and in some cases, some might say I've been championing too far out into the future. Um, and, and the thing that strikes me that I think is a strength of the system that's in place and that as we continue to move forward from a digital transformation perspective, we can't lose is the strength of consensus building across all of the countries, the experts, the industry, and the secretariats to really define what we believe is the best answer for the market. Um, and so I, I think we may want to imagine how we might gain consensus differently and maybe we can use digital tools to gain and manage and, if, and, and affect consensus but at the end of the day I think that we still have to maintain being a consensus driven organization a consensus building international standards builder and we can't lose that otherwise we've lost a part of our identity and that's not what digital transformation is about very valid point Jill? So, um, quickly, I think what, <clears throat> what works or what I have seen in the IC community is um, technical committees experimenting with some tools, with some processes, and then sharing with others. So, looking at what others are doing. And uh, we have seen uh, together with, with Vimal within the SMB a couple of examples of some technical committees trying to innovate, experiment, with either new tools, new processes, 
still within the context of our directives, um, and then sharing with the rest of the community and looking at the synergies, you know, other technical committees picking up, say, oh yeah, well that's interesting. For instance, we have one TC106 uh, working on electromagnetic exposure limits, um, um, working on a new efficiency program, you know, saying, well, you know, based on, and the chair, after his six to nine years as the chair of the committees, has kind of compiled good practices. This works well, this doesn't work well, so perhaps this could be useful to other technical committees as well. Some other TCs have done their blog page, they have done their, you know, individual web pages trying to advertise their work. Uh, and then other TCs have looked at that, oh yeah, well we should be doing the same. So I think this kind of spirit of we are one single community, but different TCs may be learning from each other. That's a good point. In fact, you know, in a light-hearted way, if I may put it in my words, you know, one of the things that I learned pretty early in my experience in IEC was, and this came to me from a veteran who, who had worked within the IEC technical committee for about 35 years, and he shared with me, Vimal, remember that directives are a guidance which have been built over the years. And if it's not written in the directives, it doesn't mean that it's not allowed. It only means it is allowed, which means that directives are a consensus amongst everyone, and you want to build consensus. But if it's not written there, it doesn't mean that anything is prohibited to the point you're making. You can fit in a technical group as long as you are having your complete committee with you and you're building consensus around some new thing that you want to do or a new approach, a new innovative thing. As long as it is not prohibited by the directives, go ahead and experiment. That's what I have learned in the SMB. Mara? Yes, and to build on uh, what Jill was saying, uh, I think that what we've also learned in the last uh, years of journey through digital transformation is that there is uh, both the interest uh, to fix existing problems uh, other than advancing and improving. What I mean is that uh, on the one hand you might have uh, standards that are more uh, narrative based and that's where the technology and the digital transformation is seen as a way to improve. But we have also other examples like Jill were referring to, to standards that are not text based. And today committees need to find a way around it because they can't really write it. It's not uh, meant for human reading. You've got models, uh, you've got uh, sometimes uh, files attached to a cover in PDF. So that's where indeed there's this interest from technical committees uh, to put the effort to be on the front line and experimenting. And this uh, enthusiasm uh, is definitely something that is across uh, the technical community. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Hussein? Uh, I would say after that, uh, never underestimate the importance of change management. Never underestimate the importance of change management internally and externally. Uh, sometimes we assume that changing the process or asking people to do this is just simply a sending a notice out or providing a video, but you really have to think about it strategically. You know, like I, I need to provide as many resources as possible. I need to provide videos, regular training sessions, because we've all attended a training session and you forget, right? Or you forget where the information is that tells you what you need to know. So you need a full campaign. Uh, of reinforcement, of, of making it easy, of walking them through. And I often have this discussion with my colleagues within the OSD. They'll go, oh, we'll tell the editors to do this. I'm like, no, you have to consult with them and get them involved and make them feel that they're part of it. So change management is critical um, if you're introducing any new tool. Um, but to help with that, it's also good to have a, an, a, encourage a natural curiosity. If you think about all of us in here, we all have little apps or hacks that we use. I remember the first time sh someone showed me how to do AirDrop and get the photos in, or someone that uses the rules on Microsoft Outlook to manage your emails, or the first time you drafted an email with your voice while you're driving the car, full stop, next line. And collectively, we have this amazing capacity to use great tools. Why don't we all encourage it and learn from each other and pool all that together? Because if we all simply used existing tools better, we could save hours and hours, or gain hours and hours of our time. So natural curiosity coupled with change management, it makes sense for me. Change management, I think that's a critical point that I come to, and I'll come back to this point later again. I have the same question for uh, 
some of our uh, BIS leadership in the front, uh, uh, Mr. Pant and uh, uh, Chandan up and uh, Rajiv. Uh, you know, is there a microphone? Uh, uh, please. And I, and then I'm going to come to the audience as to some of what you have experienced, which has been helpful. Chandan. Mm -hmm. uh. Thank you, Vimalji. I think uh, from the morning we've been talking about the OSD and there was a very uh, informative session that we had, but that also brought us to the fore the gigantic task that we have ahead of us if we really want to make the OSD platform successful. Uh, in terms of capacity building of the standard writers, right now we are only engaging with the NSBs and the NSB leaderships and the member leaderships uh, apprising them of the benefits of the OSD. But it will be really successful only if the, all the standard writers are made aware of the platform and the capacity building uh, happens. Uh, Hussain already mentioned that there are many training uh, sessions that ISO is conducting, similarly IS is conducting. Uh, but uh, it will have to be much more. And uh, from our point of view, BIS is always available. Uh, to partner with ISO and IEC and if you want any capacity building mm -hmm. ex exercises to happen within this region, uh, mm -hmm. we are ready to offer our services, our infrastructure and uh, we'll be only happy to have uh, more capacity building programs here and uh, as a commitment towards uh, the OSD experiment, uh, I can say that we will be encouraging all the 11 committees for which we have the secretariats that whenever the new NWIP comes up, uh, they should uh, explore the feasibility of going the OSD way. So Very that good. is the commitment from the IS. Thank you. Mr. Pant. Thank you. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, what I see that the fundamentals will uh, ha have to remain the same. The transparency, the openness, the consensus building, and then balance of interests. Because it should not happen that uh, those uh, partners who are less privileged in terms of uh, their knowledge levels of uh, the the IT uh, saviness uh, should should not be uh, no, at at the receiving end. They should be able to equally partner if they are techno technologically competent in terms of the technology of the uh, the, the the subject area. Uh, that should be enough. A rest job uh, that national, as Chandan also mentioned, we should gear up to you know, bring them to uh, at a level where they are equal partner, they participate, they contribute, and uh, they, they contribute in wholeheartedly in the entire process. And uh, as he also mentioned, we have our own training arm, we will be able to train them, guide them, so that uh, all the members, whether they are manufacturer, they are MSMEs, uh, they should be able to contribute and they become partner to the success story. Thank you. Any other comments, uh, Rajiv ji? Yeah, I'd just like to add on one more thing. Mm -hmm. It's another dimension, actually, that most of the national standards body, while they are contributing to the ISO and IEC standardization, but most of them have their own national standardization process also. Uh, there should be... Uh, means or methods to develop that OST system of working within the national standardization process as well. And if it can be seamless, that will be much better. But uh, it should be coordinated. That is an essential requirement. Sure. Uh, yeah. And if uh, ISO, IEC can uh, help us in uh, providing us uh, guidance on how the national uh, committees can build up their own uh, OST platforms, mm -hmm. that would be really helpful. That's an interesting point, and I think that that's a feedback which I'm sure our panelists will also take back. Every national committee's committee has its own uh, technical committee structure and processes. In many ways, they are synchronized and same, but there may be nuances, some national nuances or regional nuances. How do we cater to those? Because unwitting may be subjecting the tech itself, the members of the technical committees, two different processes, one coming from ICISO and one coming from the national committee. So if you put the expert in the middle of the process,
how does the whole process of the national level and at the international level, uh, uh, what does it mean for that individual? Let me move on. Yeah. Yes, please, uh, Ms. Huck. Uh, yeah, Anji. just one input. Like, uh, I understand that at ISO and IEC, the comments come in from the national committee. But uh, when we uh, see the national level, so BIS has been trying uh, over the past uh, couple of years to take in the inputs from our various stakeholders. So, and uh, that has been channelized through our uh, standardization portal. Uh, so I think you also must be aware uh, yes. that uh, we have uh, made an uh, uh, option like a uh, comment on the standard. So anyone can uh, uh, create a login, they can go and they can give their inputs on these standards. So I think that is a very big step. Earlier it was very cumbersome, uh, persons never knew uh, that they could comment on standards like uh, amendments or the standards or the wide circulation drafts. So wide circulation drafts, to some extent, uh, the comments were coming in. But on published standards, uh, the, even if some difficulty was faced, maybe by the testing labs, mm -hmm. maybe by the uh, users in the conformity assessment system, uh, but uh, there was never any clarity in how to give, uh, send the comments across to the committees. But now, uh, uh, on the portal itself, they can say send comments, give their comments, and that automatically goes to the national committee and it is deliberated upon and a decision is given. So I think to that aspect, uh, that angle, uh, BIS has uh, taken the uh, lead to involve all the stakeholders. Thank you. Yes, actually that's an interesting best practice that BIS has, that standards when they are in, the, in wide circulation, even post-publication, they are available on the web and any individual can create their own login and make a comment or something and all of that is then channelized to the, uh, and digitalization has in a way helped aided this process. Mm -hmm. May I make a very quick comment? Yeah, yeah. very good input, thank you. I think, yeah, well, smart and digitalization um, are definitely an opportunity for more convergence in terms of processes at national and international level, but I think this shouldn't be just one way you know, coming from ISO and IC. I think we can also learn from the members because you might have good practices that we are not even aware of, uh, that other members may not be aware of, which could be also harmonized or generalized across the whole community. So I just wanted to make this side comment because I think digital transformation will help us to establish this kind of two-way channel, which today's may not be leveraged to the, let's say, the extent we would like to. Good point. With this, let me move to the next question. I have generally held that there are three important skills required by anybody who's active in any technical committee for any kind. One, of course, is, the, is subject knowledge. If you're part of a committee, you need to know something. That's why you are called an expert. Now, with digital future, we are looking at some layer of technical understanding on how technologies work and how digitalization works. It could be something as simple as uh, how to compose a table or something that is being used, or something more complex as uh, writing, commenting uh, on an OST or uh, some other digital processes that are required. And then comes the third, uh, which is uh, uh, what I call the soft skills. Change management, communication, ability to lead, ability to find uh, compromises and get everybody together. So if I put these skills in three buckets, subject knowledge, digital technologies knowledge, and change management processes. This is an audience poll. Which one do you think is most important? Subject knowledge, digital technologies knowledge, or soft skills of change management, consensus building? By a show of hands, subject knowledge that this is most important. Let's see how many of you feel so. Subject is a given. Yes, understood, okay. Uh, you 
all agree that subject knowledge. Okay, technical knowledge, knowledge of the digital processes, uh, by a show of hands that this is very important. Uh, raise your hands. Uh, no. There is no wrong answer. So I see about 20% uh, in the audience saying yes. And change management, which is about consensus building and uh, you know, the communication around it. I see about 50%. Now, I would like to challenge you and challenge the audience. Personally, I am a soft skills person. I always thought that change management is more important because how do you trigger change? Unless I am willing to change, unless I'm able to convince the other person, we may not even be become, I mean, my expertise, even if I'm a subject expert, I'll remain a subject expert if I'm not able to convince others. I may be a genius at whatever I'm doing in my subject, but what if I cannot convince anyone, you know? So for me, soft skills was the issue, but I see that from the audience it's 50%, and you're putting most weightage on subject knowledge. So I have a question for you experts. If I was to ask you, what is most important, Mara? <laughs> So it's an excellent question because as usual with your questions, there's not just one right answer, of yes. course. <laughs> um, I would say that uh, in my opinion at least is a combination of the two, of the subject matter expert knowledge and the change management. Not because the digital knowledge is not important, but because it's the one where we can uh, overcome the gap more easily from a provider's point of view. So for instance, uh, if you were asking me 10 years ago if I were able to do certain things with my phone, I would have said, no way. And I'm, I'm thinking also about my dad using the iPhone. And he can do it because uh, the product has been designed in a way to overcome this obstacle. The subject knowledge uh, can be taught, but if you have an expert that doesn't have it, uh, it can be a problem. And the same thing with change management. It can be thought somehow, there can be practices, there can be rules to guide it, but if you do not have the mindset for change, it can be indeed an obstacle in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Good point. Hussein? Um, I, I've been spending a lot of time with committees uh, asking them, how do you feel about SMART, how do you feel about OSD, what tools do you use? And one thing that comes out is that quite often, you see a secret ingredient that is brilliant in that committee. Like I, I think it's TC67 has a requirements drafting coach. They took that initiative themselves to have a requirements drafting coach. I've seen other committees where they're like, you are the directives guy. You know the directives inside out and you jump in. You have someone else who's a project management expert in the sense that they can organize meeting across time zones using the best tools. You can go and vote which time works. So if you were to assemble the greatest committee manager or the best committee, in that skill set, you would have project management, you would have communication, you would have soft skills, as well as the obvious subject matter. But if a committee is lacking some of those, it, it, it won't move as fast as it could do. So ideally, we just need to say, what is the balance of project management, technological, soft skill expertise in our committee? Are we missing something? It's a bit like, you know how pe most people are one of four colors, red, blue, green, or red? Red is dominant, green, like, do you have a, a good mix of skills and personalities? And I think that's something that we should think about. Do we have the perfectly balanced committee, or is it unbalanced? Is it more of a, 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 a subject-driven, or is it more project-driven? I don't know. Jill? Well, I think a couple of years or decades back, if you had asked the same question to an IEC audience, the subject matter expertise would rank on top, probably 90%. Or, um, I think things are changing, and I think I totally agree with Mara and Hussein. I think it's just a question of balance, but I think the soft skills are just coming on top and are becoming much more important. So at some point, the, the task of an expert may be even more difficult today than it was in the past because it's just not enough to be a technical expert. You need to be able to uh, navigate across different culture, to build consensus. And globally speaking, if I look at our technical community, people are really good at that. We get some really good, good experts because they can, you know, they simulation with each other. So I think it's just a question of balance, <coughs> but definitely the soft skills are increasing in importance. David? 
Well, as the digital transformation officer, I <laughs> do want to say that the digital <laughs> skills are important. Um, no, I, I, think, I think a lot of it is, look, for where we are today, subject matter expertise is a given. You can't, you can't get in the door if you don't have subject matter expertise. I think where we're going to be in five or ten years, if you don't have digital technology skills, you're likewise not going to be able to get in the door. I think it's going to be such a foundational skill for being a part of where we're going. At the same time, I do think, though, that a higher evolution of change management will continue to be what separates good from great. And I think those people who are great are going to be the ones who have learned how to work in more agile ways of, of taking smaller iterations faster. I think we're also seeing the convergence of so many different disciplines, whether it's biochemistry or it's across smart cities or it's across smart cars, etc. The convergence of all these different technical disciplines is going to require people who have strong technical subject matter expertise to be open to understanding different um, subject matters and, and learning how to work together to create something that hasn't been thought of before. So I, I think and I hope that digital is, is important today, but I think in the future it's probably not going to be what separates somebody from, from good to great. Thank you very much. In, I think, uh, thanks for these answers, I think that gives a well-rounded impression of actually what I have always felt, that we all need all of it. Subject matter knowledge is required to open the doors. Once the door is open and you're sitting at the table, it's digital tools which help differentiate whether you are effective and efficient or inefficient and still stuck in the past. And then when you want to make progress, that's when the abilities, the soft skills come into play because consensus is important. And Building that consensus will take you into the future. I can share my personal experience that uh, uh, as chair of the SMB, the single biggest skill that I have to bring to the table is actually change management. So for me, subject knowledge also becomes important that how to bring about change, how to trigger innovation and new ideas at the SMB. That's my subject knowledge that I need to br bring into the table. Nobody expects me to be an AI expert or sustainability. And if, you, if somebody does, too bad for them because they will not get it from me. But my ability to bring everybody together, to have a sixth sense on uh, the body language, even when everybody is saying yes, but do they feel yes or are they feel feeling compelled or pushed into a corner and saying yes. Those signals for in my role as SMB chair become important for me. And that's the skill set which I guess is uh, what the SMB members have uh, uh, sought of me and why I'm in this uh, position. So I welcome each of you to introspect and reflect on this idea that when all three are required, at what stage of the journey within your technical committee are you personally at? Are the rest of the members, as Hussein said, do you have enough project management skills? You have enough uh, subject knowledge, expertise, and digital skills, and also the soft skills so that everything can come together very well in the group that you are. And each group is unique, so you will have to look at it from that perspective. Given the shortage of time, let me come to the last question that I wanted to ask. And this is first to the panelists, and then I'll open the floor. Each of you, that single biggest thing that you think from your total experience, if any committee has to be successful in the digital future, what is that single biggest thing? My idea is that we will have a four bullet list, which will be the magic pill everyone is going to take care of. Okay, So up to you, one very specific point that you think that they can marry themselves to, and that then they, they can be 
gurus at the technical committee. David, you want to go first? So from my perspective, <clears throat> I think when you look across the markets and you look across all of the trends that are happening, what we continue to see is a pace of change that is accelerating and, and is not going to slow down. And so from a technical committee perspective, from an expert's perspective, I think we have to get married to the idea of moving fast, failing fast, and recovering and adapting to the, the changing realities. Otherwise, we'll be creating standards that are for technologies and products that have long passed us by. So would you say agile, be agile? Is that summarize uh, what you're I like agile. OK, agile. <laughs> Jill? Along a little bit the same line, I would say open-minded. I think that would certainly uh, align with what David said. Um, technical comedy, it's just not enough to say we've been doing great standard for the last decade, 30 years, 50 years. The world is going to change faster, as David said, so you need to be open-minded, welcome new ideas, and then you're going to be prepared for the future. Open-minded, very good. Mm -hmm. Mara? It's quite along the lines of yours because I was thinking, don't be scared. Because uh, change uh, always, uh, is always caring uh, and uh, there's always this uh, intrinsic resistance, but uh, it's a journey that is inevitable. And uh, we do want to remain relevant. We do want to keep providing the best services for the market. So there has to be this uh, openness uh, and uh, do not be scared to change. Don't be scared. Hussein? I was to simplify something I haven't said, I would say keep it simple. Why are we doing this? For the benefit of the end user. Is this useful for the end user? Have we drafted it as simply as possible? Have we used the tool to simplify our life? We want to, we want to encapsulate that to make it easy to go forward. Um, so yeah, I think if you, if you keep it simple and you focus on why you're doing something, in the same way that at university, you don't necessarily want the lecturer who has the most PhDs. You want the person that can explain it in the simplest way. And I think the same applies here. I, the best committee manager is not necessarily the one with the most decorated and experienced, but it's the one that can convey that information in a simple way that people can digest, and that's the win. Excellent. So we have our four-point list. Be agile, be open-minded, don't be scared, and finally make sure that you're focused on why you're doing something and you know, keep that customer in the center of this dialogue. Brilliant. Anyone who has a point which is different from these? I open the floor, any suggestion, any thought? Interestingly, you have not mentioned technical skills, but this also tells me that somewhere when you're looking at the real trigger for change, that trigger has to be a personal one. If I can be, uh, not be scared, I can be courageous. If I am open-minded, if I am building consensus with everyone and you know, moving fast enough, I think I can win. And those abilities will dictate my ability to ab absorb technical skills or whatever is required for the job at hand. Good points. Any other thoughts, Mr. Narang? No, they can't hear you at the back. Here's a microphone. So, so, so I think whenever we are proposing any digital uh, uh, transformation, uh, one thing that we must somehow convey very explicit and a crisp and simple manner to all the committee members is why. What value will it bring to them as an individual professional and uh, to the community? Without answering this why in a simple manner, mm -hmm. I think people, in spite of being open, in spite of not being scared, sure. will they take initiative? Why should they take initiative? Yeah, that's connected to the, the point Hussein made. Anyone else? Uh, yes, please, Hussein. Uh, just while they're getting the mic, what often happens is uh, our marketing and sales team will often ask committees to promote the standard. They say, who is this targeting? And then our heart sinks when someone says, 
everyone. You're like, what do you mean everyone? Is this for a beginner, advanced user? And the fact that there is not a, cl a clarity on who the end user is, is a bit troubling sometimes. Some standards are meant to be very broad for everyone, but some of them have a specific remit. Is it for a compliance officer? If you're not clear on the target audience, that's a problem, I feel. Exactly. Yes, please. So I have uh, another point, being focused. Many times what happens, uh, you, uh, there are many examples of uh, AI projects being failure or digital transformation failure. The reason is they are placing the technologies in the forefront, forgetting the objectives of their organization. So many a times uh, in a committee work or in any organization, when there is a lot of change management, technologies, everything is playing together, there is a chance we may lose track or we may deviate from our main objective. So my point would be, be focused. Be focused, good point, very good point. To, to remain focused on what you are really trying to deliver to the right audience. Any other points from anyone? If I can just yes, uh, please, sir. fine tune that a little. Uh -huh. I like to call it customer focus. Mm -hmm. Customer focus. Mm -hmm. What the customer requires, what the market needs are, to analyze that and you come to your own self-conclusion that this is the right way to go. Mm -hmm. It should not be imposed on uh, the organization to go the digital way. It should, the need should arise from within. Now this is what the customer wants, mm -hmm. this is what the focus is and this is what the market expects from us. Mm -hmm. And that should drive that change management and technology requirements. Excellent input. I think being clearly focused, doggedly focused on that customer, that makes a big difference. With this, I think we have a wonderful list, four plus one, five. Jo mool mantra kehte na, to technical committees ke liye, digital age mein jo mool mantra hai. The, the, the commandments, if you were to look at commandments for the committees, technical committees, this is equivalent to those, and I will just narrate those, and I think this is a brilliant list, as a, and this could be actually taken as an output of this session for purposes of further reporting also. One, be agile. Technical committee success in the digital future is going to come from their ability to be agile. Second, their ability to be open-minded. Open-minded is also a reflection of their ability to absorb differing views and paradigms and different ideas and bringing them together into one. That is what open-minded means. Third, don't be scared. The world is going to be tough out there being courageous, taking it on the chin, and then bouncing back. I think that ability is going to be a critical one. And fourth, I like to call it the KISS principle. Keep it simple, stupid. Uh, uh, keep it simple. Don't complicate things. Be very clearly focused also. Customer focused where you want to deliver. That's the five top points. With this, a big round of applause to our panelists, please. Thank you very much. That's the conclusion of the session, and I hand back uh, to our M MC, please. Thank you. Thank you, panel, and especially Mahindru, sir. You know, I didn't want to miss on this discussion, so I just went there and said to listen to what the panel is discussing. And it was wonderful discussion. So we got this five-point idea on how to make uh, a technical committee successful. So uh, let's move forward now. The next session is on smart conformity assessment, India market needs.
So till now we have been talking about smart standards, online tools, ISO IC pilots on smart standards again. So now it's time uh, to know what the smart conformity assessment is all about and how it is going to work, especially for Indian market. I'm sure many of our par uh, participants are waiting to hear on this very important topic. And for that, we have with us Mr. David Nix, uh, Digital Transformation Officer IC, and uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Hadi, Hussein Hadi. So uh, I once again welcome them for this next session. to put on the microphone so I have to stand over here today to make sure that I don't lose the, the, the microphones. So I, we want to talk to you a little bit about smart conformity assessment and, and then we want to open the floor up and, and to hear from you about smart you know, conformity assessment in the India market. Um, and I, I just want to share a little context around how this is getting, how this has been started. And, and so I think I've shared before that my background hasn't been in standards and conformity assessment. And, and as I was brought into the IEC, I guess almost a year and a half, almost two years ago now, when I first started looking at what we need to do from a digital transformation perspective and where things are going, um, clearly SMART was underway. But as I learned more about how the value chain for standardization works and what quality infrastructure is, and I began to understand what conformity assessment was, it kind of became clear to me that as I spoke with people when I would say, well, what do you use standards for? They would say, well, I want to get certified, or we want to be certified and such and such. And so if I had started this from a blank sheet of paper, I think I would have started with conformity assessment. It's almost kind of like, how do you be focused on that end user and what their needs are, and then I would have worked my way back. I think conformity assessment is a really critical part of how we provide value of smart standards in the future. I actually don't think that we can design smart standards without thinking about conformity assessment into the future and how that may work and what those opportunities are. Fortunately, I'm not the only person who feels this way. So one of the first things that I did was I went out to do a market scan. I said, who else, if I just say digital conformity assessment, what am I gonna find? What else is out there? And, and just with a very quick, easy search out there, it, I'm able to go and find several different initiatives that are happening across the industry to explore how to create digital conformity assessment. And they're happening with IEC and ISO members, but also outside of IEC and ISO. What, most interestingly, the first thing that I found was an organization um, based out of Germany that's looking at the digital conformity assessment certificate. How do they create a machine readable certificate? And, and as I began to ask the IEC conformity assessment team, I began to understand better around what that may mean. Not only is it how do I create a machine readable conformity assessment certificate for products, but imagine the ability to cross borders with products and then enable the tracking of products and the tracking of that conformity assessment certificate across borders just by scanning things. Whereas today, I think a lot of times you either have to have the piece of paper or you have to look it up online somehow to find it. But if I could just scan something and go, oh, there's the certificate. Those are the kinds of use cases that I was presented with and it's the kind of thing that this organization, BAM, is looking at. <clears throat> Likewise, there's work that's happening within BSI and Microsoft to, to run a one-day workshop on different changes or novel approaches to conformity assessment. 
um, WTO members and stakeholders are looking at um, digital solutions for, for conformity certificates and, and quality infrastructure activities. So there's a tremendous amount of movement in the industry around how do we take advantage of digital innovation and conformity assessment. And for IEC and ISO, I don't think that we can wait until we figured out smart standards in order to go do conformity assessment. I think we need to be co-developing those as we go. So as I looked at, um, I was learning all of this as we go, right? But as we look at quality infrastructure, we understand metrology, standards, accreditation, and the IEC is playing across largely standards and, and accreditation. I think ISO is, is playing in a similar space Within the IEC though, and we look across the value chain for the IEC, what we're focused on for conformity assessment is the engagement and the relationship to regulatory adoption and compliance, peer assessment, testing, certification, inspection. And we're thinking about how do we link those conformity assessment value chain activities to the upfront value chain activities of creating and managing smart standards. <clears throat> So as we've been working on this through the end of last year, um, we began to understand through our smart standards pilots, the need for smart conformity assessment. Um, interestingly, I don't know if you guys know this, however, it, it was a surprise to me. I learned this last year, probably in the August timeframe, <laughs> because we were working really hard on how do we create smart standards. And one of the most important parts of smart standards is being able to identify the requirements automatically. How can we automate the identification of requirements across all of the standards? And it's really complex, right? Some requirements are embedded in tables. Some requirements are embedded in footers. Some requirements are written in completely different you know, terms. So it's really difficult to figure that out. And then as we're working through these standards, we were working with IEC 6601, which is a medical device standard. As we're working through that, someone said, well, have you looked at the test report form? Now, can I just get a show of hands? How many of you know what the test report form is? And I just want to see if it was just me. Does anybody else know what it is? We've got a few people. All right, so it wasn't entirely just me. So the test report form is a document that you can go out to the IEC website, to the conformity assessment website, probably to several members' websites, and you can download the test report form. It's primarily used by our testing labs to be able to look at a standard and identify what they have to test, what kind of tools and equipment they need to do those tests, and then it gives them a template for tracking the results of those tests so that they can say this product conforms to this standard. So it's a really interesting form and it's really great. As I begin to look at the form, the way the form is structured and what's embedded in that test report form are the requirements from the standard. So not only have we already taken the requirements from these standards and put them into tables and identified them, We've actually built a process around doing that. We actually have conformity assessment experts who work with TCs and, and experts from standards to identify the, re the requirements and track the, all of the questions and answers and to publish these test report forms. So in fact, in the middle of last year, I found out that we've actually already done smart standards and we created 1,900 test report forms that have identified the requirements for all of those standards. Now, I could have spent the next six months continuing to go through and generate and think about how do we automate the identification of requirements and standards, but now what we found was the opportunity to take the test report forms and use those to train machine learning, use those to train AI so that we can better identify requirements from standards. Ultimately, if we can accurately identify the equipment lists that come from standards, if we can accurately identify the requirements that come from standards, we should be able to automate the creation of the test report form. So not only would we have 1,900 test report forms, we would have 11,000, one for every single standard that's out there, certainly where it's applicable or not. 
So when we look at this, not only are we finding that we need to figure out smart standards, but we need to do that hand in hand with conformity assessment. Otherwise, we may end up spending a lot of time doing work that's either already been done or work that we're going to have to redo in the future when we finally get around to looking at conformity assessment. So as part of that, what we're beginning to now think through is how do we incorporate smart conformity assessment pilots into what we're doing? How do we think about designing hand in hand smart standards and conformity assessment at the same time? This isn't just how do we think about pulling and extracting the standards or conformity assessment information from standards, but we're also working with ISO CASCO and the IECCA systems to look at the 17,000 series, which is basically the guides for how you do conformity assessment and the standards around that. But how do we embed that into our smart standard structure so that that information can become more easily used, more accessible, and more applicable in the marketplace. At the same time, we're working across the conformity assessment board with NIEC, and we're working with Working Group 19, which is focused on digital transformation to understand how we might create more specific pilots that enable our members to be more effective with digital and digital conformity assessment in the future. This year, we also have a joint conformity assessment group that's working with the IEC ISO SMART program that's continuously looking at the work that we're doing on SMART standards and infusing into that their ideas on SMART conformity assessment as well as helping us think through how we manage uh, the design of SMART standards in order that it supports conformity assessment in the future. So, as I mentioned, we've gone through and identified all of this information that we can begin to pull from the, the standards and in order to generate uh, smart conformity assessment, which again needs more definition, and we're working on defining that pilot. I think at the same time, very similar to how smart standards can enable end users, smart conformity assessment can enable end users, conformance test labs, industry, et cetera, at the same time, just like smart standards can enable authors, we see how smart conformity assessment can also enable the efficiency of our conformity assessment experts. So for example, when we think about today the way conformity assessment data is created and thought of, it's generally after standards are published. We publish the standards and then the conformity assessment teams are engaged. And I think there are good reasons for that, right? I think we have, there's a, there's a strong delineation, segregation of duties, the separation of standardization and conformity assessment. I would challenge whether that's the way it needs to be in the future, but certainly from an operational perspective, when we begin to look at how we can use smart data and smart conformity assessment to drive efficiency of engaging our experts, there are opportunities to streamline those processes. We're currently working through how do we identify and prioritize those opportunities and incorporate them into this smart pilot. This isn't easy. Every time I, I, I and, and again, I'm not the conformity assessment expert. I listen to what you guys tell me. I listen to what other experts tell me and I incorporate that into the process that we're going through of digital transformation. I incorporate it into the journey. So whenever I've had these conversations before, quite naively I come in and go, digital transformation can change conformity assessment. And then invariably I get the person that raises their hand and they say, look, I work in the explosive environment. Um, I don't know that we really want to change what we're doing because the risk of what we're doing in the market is so significant that if we undermine the value of our conformity assessment systems in these explosive environments, the impact to people could be so significant that we would never do that. It's a great question. I, I don't know the answer to that, but there is clearly a risk aspect that we need to think about in terms of how far are we willing to go relative to the potential impact that it could create. Again, I mentioned and talked about a little bit the segregation between standardization and conformity assessment. In most markets I've been to, they're very separate. They, you know, you've got standardization that happens over here, conformity assessment over here, and they don't really work together. They don't think of However, when you think about 
digital transformation, you think about the value of digital transformation, digital transformation is in, uh, on, on, a, on whole, right? It's about cutting out non-value added parts of the value chain and streamlining that. And so if you were to begin to look at this and say, how would you go and disrupt the conformity assessment and standardization market, you'd say, I'd bring those two things closer together. I'd, make the, I'd connect standardization and industry usage and conformity assessment in a very simplified life cycle that made it easy for everybody. Is that possible? Are we then undermining some of the value of standardization? Are we losing value of conformity assessment? These are questions that need to be answered. I don't know that. But there could be this emergence of a gray area. We talk about third-party conformity assessment, which is very clearly important. But then we also talk about kind of industry self-validation and or maybe self-assessment. And maybe that's this gray area that we haven't, you know, traditionally we haven't been playing in because it hasn't been something that was really useful or we haven't had the tools to do it. But maybe that's something that digital transformation can help us do and manage in a more streamlined fashion rather than it being these ad hoc efforts that are happening everywhere. At the same time, what's the role of the regulator in terms of how smart standards roll, you know, goes out into the future. You know, it, would you imagine that a regulator is going to adopt a specific requirement from a standard? Or what if they adopt based on domains? What if they say, we're going to adopt regulations on sustainability, and that pulls these three requirements, those five requirements, those 10 requirements from across seven standards? How would we do conformity assessment to that? Again, I don't know. I think these are hard questions. I think there's a lot of work that has to be done. And definitely it's going to be through engagement with our members and the markets to understand what can be done and what can't be done. These are long-term questions that we'll have to continue to work out. Last, for us, for the IEC, is the role of the conformity assessment system sufficient for digital use in the future? Do we need to evolve that? How does it need to evolve? These are all questions that we're continuing to work through and that we're going to try and champion pilots this year to begin to test and get results back. Um, we don't have answers to what that looks like. We don't know exactly where that's headed, but we will continue to iterate and figure out. What we do know is that we can't wait until the end and then think about doing conformity assessment. We need to do that together. So the question that I would ask to the audience, the question that I'd love to get feedback from you guys on, is what's conformity assessment like in India? What are the challenges or the opportunities that you see for conformity assessment? And how should we be thinking about that in the context of smart standards? What's the impact that you see for smart standards into conformity assessment in India? So I'd like to open that up. I'd like to take questions, but I'd also like to hear from you as your ideas on conformity assessment and smart standards. I think you're at the conformity assessment table, if I understand everybody's role on that table. Thank you, David. Uh, to answer your question in one word, huge. I mean, a country of 1.4 million people where you're talking to BIS, which is the custodian of all standardization, not only what is covered by ISO and IEC, but even beyond that. I think it's all over here. And so I think the impact of uh, India getting involved in this is huge. India is, and BIS itself, uh, over uh, decades of experience in BIS of uh, conformity assessment and certification and testing in laboratories and uh, training. So the impact itself is huge. I think, to me, what we really need to understand uh, when I put on my India hat is how does digital transformation make the lives of most of the uh, companies easier, better, because bear in mind the number of companies or private sector players who may be involved with standards writing and standards development process may be fewer. But implementation of standards, when we look at compliance and certification, it's a huge number. 
I'm sure my colleagues in PIS can give you a flavor of the numbers, but it's a huge number of assessees who are in touch with PIS. How do we make their lives easier? How do we make the process simpler? I think that to me would be an important aspect in India. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Vimal. Um, Hussein, I don't know. Do you want to spend a little time? Do you want to share from the Casco perspective? Very quick, or? One slide, actually. Yeah. Great. Uh, as hopefully most of you are aware, the ISO Committee for Conformity Assessment is CASCO. So CASCO is responsible for conformity assessment in ISO. It develops policy, it publishes standards, relates to conformity assessment, but it does not perform conformity assessment activities. It's basically giving you the, the guidelines, the tools to, be, to enable yourself to do that. Now, in line with the comment made earlier, how can we make it easier for people to navigate this? And it's about navigation, where to find the right information, how to leverage that. So one of the pilots that we are developing is a decision matrix, basically a, a signpost, uh, a way of getting you where you need to be. So we're developing a deliverable link to a decision matrix based on existing CASCO standards. And that contains guidance on how to choose the right CASCO tool for scheme owners. So the audience for this is people that are not necessarily familiar with the CASCO toolbox, hopefully most people here are, familiar with basic conformity assessment concepts or who are working closely or distantly with CASCO standards such as scheme workers or regulators. The key deliverable for us is a framework that guides the users in the development and use of schemes which builds or incorporates on the CASCO tools and how to apply those tools. It basically, I mean to simplify it, is how to specify the assessment for conformity. And this is jointly being done by the CASCO experts working with IT developers, working with user experience designers to come up with a way to get people where they need to be quickly. And essentially, it comes back to what digital transformation is. How can I be more efficient? How can I get the information I need quicker? Simple as that. Great. So I think I'd like to also just share one of the pilots that we did last year in partnership with the Norway, um, with the Norway National Committee. I shared that earlier yesterday and we showed how they created a smart app and how that smart app was for their electric utility industry users. Part of where they're headed with that in the next evolution of their pilot is not only that the industry users could be downloading JSON or XML and implementing that, but then they could take their implemented version and upload it back to that website and that they would go through and validate whether their implementation met the requirements of the standard. So in fact, they see this tool as not only a way to access standards, but also to begin to provide some of that conformity assessment um, tool set for industry users as they continue to progress. It's another way that we're beginning to try and engage with our members to think through how we can use the, the conformity assessment and use smart standards to enable that um, with industry users. It kind of to Vimal's point, how do we make it simpler for the implementation and assessment of standards? So with that, are there other questions? Yeah. Uh, thank you, David Desen, for this session. And uh, not a question, but a comment or a different perspective, I would say. Uh, we are saying that the smart standards will help us in having the automated TRFs, uh, the better test results, which means a digital transformation of the conformity assessment will also happen side by side. Uh, we also then need to focus as to how this digital transformation of the conformity assessment will help impact the development of standards. Because if what we are saying will happen, we will have uh, unlimited data available with us from the conformity assessment results and how that can impact the development of better standards. I think that also needs to be publicized, uh, put into focus, uh, which will probably give more impetus to what we are trying to achieve. 
Yeah, I think that's great, and I, I think it's an excellent point. I, I still wonder, I, are, we, are we beginning to merge the creation of standards and conformity assessment in the way we want to? Or is that going to challenge some of the existing models that we have for how conformity assessment and standardization are, are separate? I think we can absolutely do it. One of the things, and, and I'll talk a little bit about it later, but one of the things that we were looking at is if we were looking at automotive recalls, what if we could take all of the data from automotive recalls and feed that back into TCs to say, look, here's where product deficiencies exist in the market. How do we incorporate that back into our TC development practices in a scalable way without overloading TCs for sure? Um, but it, it's a similar aspect of how do we take implementation compliance in the market and help drive that back through our authoring processes? Continue to continue to be separate as far as the impartiality is concerned, as far as the independence is concerned. But I think this uh, sharing of data both ways is going to be critical in the future. I agree with you. I yeah, I, I would add to that. Um, if you think about it, the, that kind of expertise in the realm of a few consultants that can rely on their experience. In my experience, this is what always trips people up. I've had examples where they've had to do this. And we know a lot of people that have had nightmare with 9001 and others where, you know, so if we could actually, exactly what you say, if we could rely on data, we could see where the pain points are, what was tricky, how long it took to do it, that would really go full loop and really help us. And use the example of the automotive industry, Tesla has an edge on that because they have live data you know, which helps them th with that. So I think, I think your point is critical. It's really critical. Yeah. Uh, so so can, can, can you go back to your previous slide where you were talking about gray areas? I'm, I'm, I'm going to trust you on that one. I'll go, yes, there were gray areas. I'd have to switch back to the other PC, and okay. <laughs> that'll take okay. me a second. Anyway, I'm with so, you. So I'll talk about my, so uh, see, I'm coming from the domain experts and standard development people rather than from the uh, standard body. So the way we, we work on, uh, particularly in my committee there, I have been leading some projects, uh, the team which develops the standards, I uh, ask them that let us develop the testing schema also ourselves rather than, you know, uh, we develop standard, then we give it to the BS, uh, that's a separate division which will do the testing and then come, come back, back and forth. Uh, I remember in smart meter standard, we had two and a half year delay in uh, after the standard being developed and the uh, first meter being tested as certified as per the standard because there are a lot of back and forth needed. But uh, so the way I would like to, to put it is that the testing schema or conformity assessment framework uh, uh, schema should be developed by this, uh, the team who has actually developed because they, the, that, that team has got the right the domain the experts. They have been from the field. They have been designing products, manufacturing products. If they can uh, be also responsible for that, then I think we'll have minimum back and forth if in case we do have or we may not even have that. That is yeah. one of the gap I think I still find we need to update this process to uh, bring this responsibility seamless. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I think I, I think that's a, it's a great point, and I think it almost touches back on the discussion we were just having in the last session, which is what's the evolution of the TC as we keep moving forward, and we talked about how subject matter expertise is continuing to blend based on different disciplines and different expertise. But it e equally could be the expertise of standardization and conformity assessment that also need to blend in terms of making the TC more efficient and more effective in terms of delivering what we want for our end user value. I, I agree wholeheartedly. I think a lot of the decisions that we're talking about here aren't whether or not we can do this. We can. The question is, do we want to? And I think the answer to that question isn't as simple as can we. Vimal. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Nishat. Yeah, so uh, about this Casco pilot. So this uh, uh, tool will help in choosing the appropriate scheme, appropriate conformity assessment scheme, as I can understand from yes. this. Yeah, so, but there is a bigger challenge. Uh, once the scheme is chosen, then how to implement it at the ground level. Like BIS, it is operating conformity assessment schemes based on type two, type five. And we have a, 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 a sort of a, it is not a direct regulatory role, 
but uh, the government of india has mandated certain products for uh, mandatory compliance and having the bis certification so because of which uh, the manufacturers are uh, of for the like they have no option actually so they go in for the bis certification so when we go in for this smart standardization when we go into all these aspects maybe we are even able to like uh, identify choose the schemes but when we implement it on the ground then we have to reach out to this very large base of manufacturers so that uh, i believe is going to be a maybe a bigger challenge how to percolate all this down and get it implemented and in the right spirit I, I so your views on that I think one thing that you, you've, you've emphasized really well, which has been a recurring theme throughout the last two days, is the importance of filtering down SMART to the national level, to the local level. So when we, I mean, well, look, we're very mindful of what SMART looks like on a scalable level across the ecosystem, but we have to be mindful, how do we scale that in a way that can be implemented at a local national level? And I think your point is really well made, and whether it's OSD, whether it's SMART, we have to we have, to, we have to make that happen. It's a complicated question, but I can see that the need is, is clear. Yeah, and, and to add on to that, I, I think that, you know, from, and I, I think this needs to be a general theme for our entire digital transformation journey, and I think it starts with um, Rajiv's point around, it's, it's a customer outside in view of what we need to do. We need to start with understanding the customer and work our way back to how do we go make that real. And so from an IEC or an ISO secretariat perspective, we can't just sit in Geneva and build a tool and then turn it on and send you a user ID and password and say, good luck, we hope that works. We have to work in coordination with our national members, with our national committees to understand how to implement these tool sets in your market, understanding your understanding of the customer need and then we have to figure out how to adapt, how to configure, and how to change that so that it works in this market. I, I think one of the challenges and, and the value proposition of digital transformation is that it used to be that it was a one-size-fits-all solution. If you had a piece of technology, you rolled it out, and everybody could have it, but it worked the same way for everybody. And now when you see digital transformation, when you see these digital companies that are out there, it's not about one size fits all, it's about personalized content, personalized functionality for you. And so I think the tool sets and the digital capability, the value proposition of, of IEC and ISO in the future is that it's not a one size fits all solution. It's a how does it work for India solution. It's a how does it work for Germany solution and the ability to tailor it while retaining those common capabilities and the common value propositions that we want to have and not, um, and, and not losing that. So absolutely agree. I absolutely agree that it has to be driven from the National Committee. There's no way IEC and ISO are going to scale out to be able to understand every local market. It will never happen. And I think that's going to be a part of the shift in roles, a, a part of the dynamic between the roles and responsibilities between members and the secretariats in the future. If I could just add, um, you notice and yet from yesterday, the, the way we started SMART is to build use cases. We went out to the market and we found what are the problems or where are the opportunities to use technology to help them. And one thing I would say is, while we're mindful that that relationship is owned by the local NSPs and we never want to step on their toes, if you're willing um, to recommend people from the ecosystem that would like to engage with the SMART program, it would be a great way to test the tools with us. Obviously, we will do that very closely in partnership with you, but giving us that joint access to the end users will really help, and we'd love to have them involved in testing the products and giving their thoughts as well. So if you have some people in mind, um, you already helped us by inviting industry to the session. It was wonderful to talk to people from Siemens and others. That would be great, so we can engage with them and, and incorporate that.
but it is if i think as a regular point of view how i can penetrate in this system this is a big question for me <laughs> so how it can be leveraged for regular point of view if you can throw some light on this so if, if I'm understanding, um, you know, the, the question is not necessarily from an end user perspective, but more so from a developer perspective. Technically, how can I leverage this? Um, I was having this conversation a, a bit earlier with, with some of the gentlemen at the table in the back, and um, we were talking about the, the, the role of XML. And I think XML is a great example of kind of a technical tool to use and access data. I think what we're going to see through SMART, through SMART standards, and through SMART conformity assessment are the continued evolution of access, access points into this vast data that exists there. So I think you'll see access through APIs. I'll th I think you'll see JSON formats in the future. I think you may even see reusable apps where you could download, let, let's, let's really go out there, maybe it's an open source app that, you, that starts you moving forward and then you can build something from there. I think those types of opportunities are gonna continue to evolve that are going to enable developers and technical people to assist in building access for end users into this vast data. I think the challenge and, and where I feel like we really also need to continue to focus is how do we also make sure that that isn't um, isolated stovepipe access. So you go here and you get this, or you go here and you get this, or you go there to get that. But how do we provide access that says, if you want to search across requirements, if you want to run a query for IEC, ISO, and Indian requirements, that we have a mechanism for you to do that. I don't think we've solved that problem yet today, but I think it's on our minds for how do we work with our members to begin to solve those kinds of problems. So absolutely see the development and the IT teams as an important part of the digital future in leveraging um, smart standards and smart conformity assessment. I think that Hussein said it really well that it's no longer just about the editor. It's no longer just about the marketing person. It's about the editor, the marketing person, the expert, and the IT person coming together in a cross-functional team to go solve a problem. And we need to keep that in mind as we move forward. Thank you, sir. So as we wait for other questions, just before we finish the session, if there are, I just want to give a shout out to the team who worked on all the echo work. And uh, I just would like to give real time feedback that that's really much better today. And thank you guys. It's been great. I appreciate that. Thank you. So any other last questions, comments on conformity assessment? Great, guys, Vimal. Uh, Just a quick word to a question which was posed earlier at a point by Mr. Kishore Narang on uh, conformity assessment requirements being written by the standardization folks. This is not a new debate. This has been around even from the pre-digital age. And in the SMB, and I know that uh, the same would be the uh, case in ISO, we are very careful on treading between standardization and conformity assessment because I've seen often enough conflict of interest also coming up. That said, we realize that digital transformation can be a tool which can sometimes help manage that con conflict of interest that we see. It all depends on how information is shared from the standards writers to the conformity assessment teams. As long as it is transparent and open and accessible to all, and then it is transferred from one to the other in a structured manner, yes, it makes sense. But uh, generally, one has to be very watchful on this because unfortunately, the cha in the past at least, the challenge of conflict of interest coming up has been tremendous. We have to be watchful of that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, and, and, and this 
and I think Vimal, you've you've hit it on the head. This is the the dilemma that we're faced with, and I. I from my perspective, I fully respect the segregation that's occurred and the value of that in the marketplace. It's undeniable. At the same time, I think we have to look at it from a risk perspective in the future that says, if we don't do something differently, are we opening ourselves up to disruption in a way that we can't manage it? And so what's the right middle ground to change what we've been doing and avoid disruption, but not lose the essence of who we were and the value proposition that we started with. I, it's a journey. Again, it, it, there's no answer right now, today, tomorrow, but it will continue to evolve along this journey as we go. So thank you guys very much for the conversation and the feedback today, and we will be transitioning to our next topic. So for me, you are the picking team? Okay. So, yeah. Well, and we're, so we're going to move on to discussing um, artificial intelligence and the work that's been done around um, AI and smart. And I'll turn it over to Hussein to kick us off. How long do you need, David? They asked if we do 30 minutes. I think we can. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 15 or 10 minutes? Give me 10. Minutes. 10? All right, cool. All right, uh, we've talked a lot about conformity assessment. Let's go back to AI, which is a topic of key interest. I love the presentation today. What I'm gonna try to do is build or complement what was discussed and avoid duplication. I'm gonna go at a fast pace because I, I didn't get a chance to delete all the slides I wanted to, so bear with me. All right. Uh, basically, last year, the Collins Dictionary Word of the Year was, in fact, AI, understandably. When, what we wanna do is work out where hype ends and reality begins, and what does it mean for us as a standard development organization? So AI was the word of the year. For Cambridge Dictionary, the word of the year was hallucinate, the fact that AI cannot always be reliable. And of course, one of the reasons AI really picked up is because unlike a lot of technologies, it's tangible in the sense that the average user can use it. We've all been exposed to it in various different ways. If you want a good example of that, look at the Times Best Inventions of 2023. They list some epic inventions that are innovative and that might have an impact on our world. And they actually have 10 AI inventions in there. So have a look at that. One of the ones that I was really interested in was authentic, uh, authentic uh, AI. You can take a, uh, an object and it'll tell you whether it's authentic or not. And I should say, uh, congratulations to the Bureau of Indian Standards. You're already on the way there. The fact that you can authenticate uh, uh, if, 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 it conf if, a, if a bottle of water something conforms by putting the number in. So already that product there is something that you can take to the next level. So congratulations on that. That is exactly the right way to go. And, you know, it's not just, even in the standards world, we're already seeing the emergence of AI-driven tools. These are just some of the examples here. Um, for ISO, uh, for, for ISO uh, 5001, for ISO 27001, these are already AI-powered assessment tools being provided by the private sector and uh, some of our NSBs. So this is just a few examples here. I won't spend too much time, but just a, a recap of the definition of AI, of course, you should go to uh, ISOIC 22989, which I think is not said enough, is freely available. We should be championing and promoting that. It's a list of AI uh, terms and definitions that anyone can use. We should be giving that to schools, universities, and getting the word out, because, you know, the first way of using AI is to understand what we mean and, you know, the, the difference between inputs and outputs. Here's an example of a glossary from that uh, freely available standard. So let's continue to promote that. I want to build on the presentation from this morning to talk about adoption of AI. It's one thing to see the products. It's one thing to see the investment. What are people actually using? What are companies, standards organizations, what are, where are they now? So the first thing to say is that we're talking about primarily the application of generative AI. And this is a good diagram because you can see there you have the overarching generative AI umbrella. Under that you have foundational models, then large language models, and then you have the chatbots, which we're all familiar with. Um, and just for those that are interested, uh, GPT stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. That's Optimus Prime pre-Michael Bay, which is the preferred one in my humble opinion as a child of that era. Um, and of course, if you look at some of the tools out there, there's an incredible array of uh, generative AI applications. This is a nice selection of those from IMD. If I zoom in a little bit, you could see some of the tools, some for conducting research, 
editing images, email management. Email management is a good one. I quite like using SaneBox, for example, to manage your emails. But of course, you could just use the rules of Microsoft Outlook. But the main thing here is AI works best when it's a simple problem. Because AI is actually not that smart. It just does simple things well. So once you break down your problem into those simple tasks, AI can have a huge impact. It's not a silver bullet, but it's not to be discounted either. If we're trying to classify AI in an industry application, I like what the UK Department of Education did. They came out with a report looking at what are the skills needed for the UK workforce in the future to use AI. And they split the types of AI into these categories. Now, these aren't all the applications of AI by any means, but this is what they consider the most common. Um, so you're talking about image generation, reading comprehension, translation, speech recognition, all pretty self-explanatory. But of course, if we look at today, where is AI being applied in the business sector? Um, we could say virtual assistance for business, including IT support, file classification, data processing, support for industries with risk management at factory level, real-time uh, errors, things like that. Support marketing and sales, obvious, plenty uh, to go there. So how has the global uh, ecosystem responded? Well, we've had a lot of people talking about governance. We've had the AI principles from the OECD. They came out in 2019. Um, that's continued to be interesting. The United Nations has set up a UN AI advisory body, the World uh, Economic Forum, uh, UNESCO recommendations on AI. And of course, we have some very interesting local and regional initiatives, um, the biggest of which was the EU AI Act. Um, which was finally pushed through in December. That's the first fully comprehensive legislation governing AI. Very interesting. We had the White House executive order on AI. Um, China has done some piecemeal things, but there's more legislation on the way. There's a lot of duplication here because at the end of the day, there are common principles. And what we don't want to do is get lost with, if you throw a stone, you're going to hit an AI conference, right? So there's, everyone's talking about it. But this is re really what we're all discussing. And what I find quite irritating is that whenever I see discussions of AI, unless the standards world is organizing the event, standards is not the first thing. I'm like, how do you balance opportunity risk in AI? Uh, have you read 42001? It came out just in time. Please use it. So we have to promote uh, more. I will mention the EU AI Act because it's interesting. As the first fully comprehensive piece of legislation, uh, they take a risk-based approach. They have minimal risk, high risk, unacceptable risk, and then a specific transparency risk. Not to spend too much time on that, but high risk examples would be in education, biometric systems. Uh, I had a gentleman I was talking to today about China using biometric systems. These are examples of unacceptable risk examples. Um, I, I, we, you know, we can discuss that later in more detail. A lot of countries have an AI strategy, and it's good to see that all the various NSBs are putting out AI reports. I've been, it's been a pleasure reading these. Uh, one document that I really like, it's called the Little Handbook of AI. BSI put, put it out, and it's basically to talk about AI, the importance of standardization, and to pro promote 42001. It's only about 20 pages, but adapting something like that for the market is pretty good. But these are all great reports that I'm seeing. Um, I'm going to whiz through this. AI in 2023, there's a lot to say, but what was interesting, the chat GPT hit 100 million users. See how quickly they reached that number compared to some other well-known players. Uh, Google launches BARD, it's rival to chat GPT. Uh, chat GPT was banned by the Italian authorities you know, for privacy concerns, then it was signed. Elon Musk wrote a really strange letter saying that nothing should be more powerful than GPT-4. GPT-4, he invested in it, so maybe that's why he's like, that's where I'll set the, the limit. Uh, July, we had uh, Barbie and Oppenheimer come out. We had the AI for Global Summit. We had a lot of investments start to come into AI. And you could see here some of the, the key players. Um, you could see the level of investment in Anthropic. And uh, yeah, the money starts to really come in. Suddenly, regulators start getting fidgety. You have the AI Safety Summit, US Executive Order on AI. And everyone talks about how important it is to manage AI, but of course, they're very excited about it as well. Importantly, we had the Smart Workshop in November, very mindful of everything that happened. Then in December, for me, what was the most exciting was the release of 42001, um, and that's a really, really important, game-changing standard in terms of AI, and we should use what our own committee, SC42, has put out there. What can we expect in 2024? Customized chatbots. Generative AI's second wave will be video. You know, we, we looked at the revolution in text, video will be next. Misinformation will be a problem. We have robots that multitask. 
um, white collar work starts to shift. We see the, the danger of deep fake. I don't know if you saw the, the image of the Pope wearing this weird white outfit that everyone thought was real. Uh, Vladimir Putin appearing to interview himself in a student gathering. You, you can see that, that, that this is, this is going to happen more often. A shortage of GPUs, potentially. Um, companies will have to navigate complicated regulations. So these are from articles from Stanford and MIT. You could read those in your own time. I won't spend too much time there. Key question here is, how are people actually using AI? Really, not just playing around with it. What are companies doing about it? Uh, this was a really interesting uh, survey done by Writer Buddy, looking at the 50 most visited AI tools. Now, you can look at that in your own time, but I'll say one thing that came out that was really interesting. India is the second biggest user of these AI tools. Understandably, you have a young, dynamic, technological-driven population. That's to your advantage. And if you look at the most popular AI tools, on ChatGPT is there, Bard is there. I don't know if you've used character.ai. I find it a bit gimmicky. I find it extraordinary that it's the number two used tool. It's more like customized, fun little chatbots. I don't know, but maybe I'm missing something. But this is an interesting study. You can look it up. It's fully available online to give you an idea of who is using AI, what are the key tools. Um, there was this report that I mentioned earlier, the impact of AI on UK jobs and training. Um, which are most exposed to changes with AI? No surprise, finance, law and business, consultants, etc. Um, the finance and insurance sector is more exposed to AI than any other sector. And if you think about it, a lot of their work is driven on analytics, is driven by data, is driven by a lot of changes to numbers. This is where AI obviously shines really well. Once again, we go back to this. Now, there's some interesting reports that came out last year looking at how are people using AI in practice. Um, this was an interesting one that came out middle of the year looking at the state of generative AI. The most commonly reported use of tools in marketing, sales, product and service development, service operations, that makes sense, you know, to help with customer service, to help with stuff like that. Um, respondents in the technology and financial service industries are the most likely to expect disruptive change. Um, and if you can look here, this gives you an idea of some of the uh, use of AI, drafting the first draft of text documents, personalized marketing, summarizing documents, identifying trends, brainstorming. This is quite interesting to see. Nonetheless, despite the fact that we're seeing a lot of interest in AI, the interest in generative AI has not led to an overall increase in the adoption of AI generally. It's usually only restricted to specific departments like sales and marketing. People want to use AI, but they're still dipping their toe in the water. What about the publishing sector where we operate? What are people doing? Well, look, it's fair to say that AI has an impact on authors generally. And when I say authors, I mean authors in the broadest sense, not just people drafting standards, people writing anything. You can use AI for assisted research. Um, there's an increased need for thought leadership. You can use AI to streamline content creation, automated text analysis, formatting, greater emphasis on having a voice. If you look at a lot of the generative AI tools, you could say, write me something in the style of a management consultant, write it in the style of a simpler voice. You can, you can customize that. And we saw some examples of that uh, today. Authors are shocked to find AI ripoffs. This is something we have to be aware of. You know, in theory, you can have something drafted in any style you like. Imagine someone says, this is a chatbot drafted in the style of the ISO IEC directives. We might not have control of that, but someone says, I have put in the guidelines and it could draft it in that way. What does that mean? Do we seek them out and stop them? Something to be thought about. In terms of what AI tools publishers are using today, I've, li I've listed a few examples. Assistant by Sight, Illicit, these are tools, unlike ChatGPT, they actually give you the source of the information. So you could say, I wanna, could you recommend me articles that give an opposing view to this? Could you give me articles from this author that I like? Could you give me articles related to this particular topic? But if you think about it, as a committee member, if I wanna stay on top of literature out there, I shouldn't be having to spend my time doing that manually, going to websites. I should be using tools to alert me if there's a change. And then I look at it myself. I want a tool to recommend something to me, but I can make sure I validated the source of that. And these are the type of, type of tools that can help with that. I don't know if you've ever used a Feedly. Feedly is a tool to monitor changes on websites. So you could customize your feed from those sites to give you information. So once again, this is an application of AI that shouldn't be problematic. I just, you know, as a committee member, I want you to use your brain to analyze and give me the best outcome. I don't want you wasting time researching, looking, trying to keep up to date. That's not a good use of your time. Your time is analysis. And even then, David made a good point. Could AI go even further? I'm being cautious here, but um, this was a uh, study from Nature looked at when asked about generative AI with LLMs, where do they feel 
These are publishers in scientific publishing. Where do they feel it can make a big difference? Helps researchers where English is not a first language. Makes coding easier and faster. Summarizes other research. Uh, speeds administ administrative tasks. So you can see there, those are lessons that could even apply to us as well. Another interesting study that came out, departments where publishers have implemented AR using it. 47% marketing, 25% editorial. I'm surprised publicity only 17%. That seems an obvious one. If you want to try something fun, go into a, uh, one of the classic LLMs like ChatGPT and put in, can you create a social media post to promote ISO 9001 in Russian or Arabic or English? It's not perfect, but it's not terrible. It'll give you a little thing with the benefits of the standard, with emojis and everything. Imagine if you're a poor marketer in NSP, you don't have a lot of resources. In theory, you could use that as a starting point. I can generate my social media posts, I fix it, and I stick it up there. You could see the potential. And yet, with all this, what are the guidelines we give people? What, you know, can I use this tool, yes or no? Now, ISO and IEC are at the moment expanding and building upon our guidelines for people to use, but this is an example of a guideline from uh, STM, and they've made it clear, I can use AI, generative AI for basic author support, for refining, correcting, editing. Can I use it for altering and manipulating? No, but they're kind of setting the rules there. Because I think one thing about AI, it's one thing to say, don't put any copyright, don't use anything in our copyright, but you should also ask, where can I use AI? And that's involving a more positive mindset. In terms of AI and the law, there's a battle for the soul of generative AI. The new, and, and you know, a lot of people are saying ChatGPT has trained itself on all this content available, and they haven't paid for the right to train. Is that allowed, yes or no? Is that considered fair use? At the moment, it was an arbitrary argument until the New York Times stepped up and said, I've had enough. OpenAI, you're using all my articles and you're not paying me a cent, I'm not happy with it. OpenAI are like, okay, New York Times, but we collaborate with news organizations. Training is fair use. You know, what, what, what's wrong with that? We're signing deals with publishers, like with uh, Axel Springer. We're in discussions with CNN and Fox. Why are you getting in the way of this amazing technology? What's the big deal? Um, the New York Times are like, well, the blog concedes that OpenAI used the time's work, and you have to pay for that. We go through a lot of effort to produce our content. You can't just use it as you like. But of course, what OpenAI are arguing is that they are providing derivative work. They've ingested this content, they've learned from it, and produced something else. It's an argument remains to be seen whether you believe that or not. The Guardian, for example, said, making journalism available to all should not be regarded as a free pass. Uh, the Daily Mail said, for AI search to be commercially successful, it have to be constantly updated with fresh information, and you're not paying for that. OpenAI, in response, are like, it would be impossible to train today's learning AI models without using copyrighted materials. It would be too much hassle to speak to all these millions of copyright holders. Um, we believe, you know, that it's fair use. Quick show of hands. Do you believe, open, do, are you uh, sympathetic to OpenAI's argument that ingesting all this copyright is fair use and they don't have to pay? Do you agree with OpenAI? Yes. Oh, some. Do you disagree with OpenAI? You're more on the side of the publishers. I'm seeing more, I'm seeing uncertainty, but more on the side of the publishers, which is interesting. Something to think about when, when we start to really develop this. Um, by the way, here's some of the AI company's responses. Copyright holes wouldn't get much money anyway. AI training is like a book. You know, you can see the arguments there, but from publishers like ourselves, you're like, well, we've put a lot of effort into producing this content. For you to just simply take it, regurgitate it, I don't know, is, there, is compensation fair? So that's something for us to think about in the tools we develop further down the road. Um, it was talked about today, the AI standards, just to reiterate, SC42 is great, 42001 is brilliant. I won't say too much more about that. So just to finish, where can AI really make a difference? Uh, David's going to talk about that in more detail on some of the great experiments that are being done. But just to say, this gives you an idea of how AI could have specific application at various points in the standardization process. We talked about research, for example, helping committees stay on top of developments. Um, advising where you might want to rethink your words. If you remember the survey we did yesterday, I asked you all how should you draft a uh, requirement, and only 50% got it right. This is an example where AI could suggest, don't forget to say shall, don't say must. So those are the kind of things where AI would be easy. It's not drafting for you, it's helping you draft, right? So a question that was asked today, what should committees do? So I'm just gonna finish before I hand over to David. How should you start with AI? What should you do? Well, the first thing I'll say is there's free courses out there that are brilliant. 
deep, this is a course, um, Generative AI for Everyone. Have a look at it, it's a free three hour course. You could go on it and learn from it. Amazon has a lot of free courses you could use. To, how can I use Generative AI? There's one from LinkedIn and Microsoft. So first thing to do is what should I do? Take a free course, find out what happens. You could subscribe to a newsletter. Superhuman is one I like. Um, AI Weekly, these are really good to keep up to date with AI developments. Try other AI tools, but more importantly, and this was said very eloquently by David and others, don't get a tool and start seeing if it could do something for you. Identify your pain points and opportunities. Where are the bottlenecks? If you start from that perspective, where are my pain points? Then AI can make a difference. If you start from the end user, as was said earlier, so w work from the other ends. What are the pain points that I have? What does the end user need? And then the answer of where AI could make a difference could reveal itself. So with that, I will hand over to David who will show you some really exciting uh, testing we're doing in this area. You can leave it out. Okay. Yeah, I, so, um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to switch my computer. I just want you guys to imagine that I had a beautiful presentation with these amazing demos. I'm going to tell you about them. Um, the reality is that AI is here, and we recognized that last year, and we started working with AI in a lot of different capacities. I think the slide that this slide right here says a lot about what we were doing. We're looking at how do we use AI for authoring purposes. We're looking at how do we use it to support editing and publishing. But we're also looking at it from an internal secretariat perspective. How do we add efficiency to our internal operations? And how do we support members with AI? How do we provide more transparency and analytics using AI for our members? So we're working across all of the different use cases, across all of the different user groups to identify ways in which I, the AI can help us. One of the first things we did last year is in partnership with ISO, we decided to create a chatbot using a, a, a free version of, I think it was Lambda, and we trained it on all of the IEC and ISO standards. So we took, it, we took a copy with our own proprietary chatbot, we trained it on IEC and ISO standards, and the concept was Look, I mean, AI is magic, right? So, I mean, you just you plug it in and it works. And so if we just plug in all of the IEC and ISO standards and we train it a little bit, it could create redline versions for us, right? I mean, just, you know, it, it could help us answer questions about what are the relationships of one standard to another standard or what are all of the requirements that are associated with implementing a, you know, a commercial building in India. Well, the reality was that as we went through and we built this chatbot, it actually requires far more training than you would imagine. And what we also found is that the concept of a hallucination is absolutely real. So as we would go through and we would do a, a test and we would have a discussion with the chatbot, what we found is despite training it, with IEC and ISO standards, it would make them up. What we also found is that where it did provide back answers, we weren't sure whether it was providing those answers based on content that we had trained it with, or if this is content that was publicly available that had, it had been pre-trained with. So the transparency around the source of the information was sorely lacking as we would go through and have conversations with um, this chatbot. That being said, there were some definite uh, advantages there. I mean, within the matter of three, four weeks, we were able to train it and start to have some conversations. I think the key learning from this, from that effort for us, was that making AI work isn't without effort. It does take work to train AI. You can't just plug it in and all of a sudden it works. There's an investment that has to be made. So we've also continued to use AI in the transformation of XML into smart standards. We use machine learning and AI in order to identify requirements, in order to identify the normative parts of a standard via the XML and transform that into a graph database which was powering all of the smart standards prototypes and, and demos that you saw earlier yesterday and today. As we went through that, we actually were able to compare the AI and machine learning performance to human performance. So we had a person break down 
part of a standard into and identify all of the normative parts of it. And then we took an AI engine, and a machine learning engine, and transformed the same thing. And what we found was that there was actually a fair amount of difference between the two. And it wasn't that one was more accurate than the other, it was that the way the human, the way our person was thinking about transforming and, and identifying the, the normative sections of a, of a standard were different than how the AI was doing it. And so, for example, we would have a, a person who would look at a whole section and go, that's a normative section, whereas the AI would go, that's a normative sentence, that's a normative sentence, that's a normative sentence. But after we retrained it, we were able to get the AI and the person's output to match within three or four percent. We were getting 95, 98 percent accuracy. So the reality is that we do believe we can train AI to help in the transformation of XML and PDF documents into data and smart standards in the future. We've also seen that where we took the test report forms, that test report forms which outlined all of the requirements from a standard that has been validated by people, we use that to compare with the performance of an AI engine to generate that same list of requirements. And again, what we were able to see after some training that we're in the 95 plus percent accuracy range. Not only was it us doing this, we were working in partnership with BSI out of the UK, and they were testing different machine learning language approaches and different AI engines to see if there were different results. And what we were able to also see is that regardless of the type of AI or machine learning, with training, we're able to find the similar re quality results, 95 plus percent accuracy and identification of requirements. What we learned from this work is that absolutely continuing to use artificial intelligence and machine learning and the transformation of content into data, into smart data, is a path that we can continue to do. However, it will require investment and training. So as we've gone through and continued to look at how do we use AI across all of these use cases, there are a few things that we're walking away with as next steps and learnings that are important in terms of how we move forward. One is the investment in data management and data science cannot be underestimated and it needs to be started now. It's such a foundation to where we're going to be in the next several years and it is critical for accuracy, quality, and success in the AI future. Second, what we've learned and agreed is that we can't have AI act on its own. We need to have AI assistance for people. We need to always have people involved in the process, and it almost doesn't matter what that process is. Even today, in some of the simplest things that we have AI doing, for example, I took a picture of my receipt from the hotel today and an AI engine transformed that into an app that shows me all of the line items and the receipt. At the end of the day, I still have to look at that receipt and verify it before it gets uploaded into the system. So just the basic things around how we use AI today still require people. And for the foreseeable next, I would say, at least 12 to 18 months, that is our plan that we continue to engage people in the use of AI. And the last piece is, is that it's not magic. AI isn't this magic thing that exists out there somewhere in the cloud. It actually requires IT competencies and skills and investments to make it work. You can't ignore security. You can't ignore scalability. You can't ignore data governance and data privacy when you start to use these AI engines. And if you don't have the right foundation of technology maturity in place already, AI will just exacerbate the problems that you have. It's important to continue those investments in order to be successful with AI in the future. The takeaway for us is that AI is where we are headed. There's an important part of where we're going. It's not the only way. It's not the only place we're going. And we see how people are going to be more efficient, but a critical input into what we're doing with AI. We see how governance either through SMB or through the secretariats will be an important part of how we make sure that we don't lose control over something that seems like it could spiral out of control very easily. We will continue to invest in terms of how we do this and facilitate collaboration across 
all of our members in terms of learning what they've done, sharing what we've done to make sure that we've got best practices and good practices as we move forward. So we agree that AI is an important part of what we're doing, but we agree that it's a tool and that we need to continue to harness and use that tool into the future and not replace some of the key things that we've been doing to get to this successful point. So with that, thank you for your time today. I think we're at the end. Thank you. Any queries from the audience? So, uh, thank you, David, and... Yeah. <laughs> Just one small question. Uh, excellent presentation, this one and the earlier ones also. I trust you will be sharing all this content with us. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That is most important. <laughs> Okay, so uh, thank you, David and Hussein, for the, uh, this uh, very informative uh, presentation on AI and the AI tools. And I'm sure I, uh, members will go through your website where more uh, information is given and they'll get to mo uh, know more. And uh, later on, if some more queries are there, I think we can uh, coordinate with you through mails or through video conferencing. So. Uh, I think uh, with this, we come to the end of the technical session. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, now I would like to request Deputy Director General, Bureau of Indian Standards, Mr. Chandan Behel, to come on dais and deliver concluding remarks, please. Thank you, Nisha. Good afternoon, everyone. So we've come to the end of the technical sessions uh, of this two-day workshop. And as they say, uh, high standards protect you from low quality experiences. It has truly been two days of very high quality discussions on the digital transformation in the standardization area. The workshop and the brainstorming that we've done in the last two days uh, remind me of a very important event uh, in Hindu mythology, uh, which we call as uh, Samudra Manthan, which was churning of the ocean by the gods, from which came out many divine things, such as divine knowledge, nectar, and Kamdhenu. Kamdhenu, as we all know, is a uh, wish-fulfilling bull. And uh, the deliberations of the last two days, the brainstorming, has made us believe that uh, the smart is that Kamdhenu in the standardization ecosystem, which has the probably potential and capability to fulfill the wishes of all stakeholders in the standardization ecosystem. Uh, we've learned and uh, deliberated that uh, smart can make machines understand standards and uh, also human understands machines. Uh, it can boost our fight against whatever we are doing today, climate change, helping industry towards a smarter manufacturing process, uh, even helping the governments uh, with good regulatory practices and uh, strengthening the urban development, boosting productivity and whatnot. As someone quoted uh, that digital transformation is doing more with less, using technology and ideas to serve the society. This gives us an opportunity to the global south to embrace this technology uh, and see to it that the underprivileged or less involved factors of our society uh, get involved in the standardization ecosystem, the SMEs, uh, the entrepreneurs who are just getting into uh, the manufacturing practices reap the benefit of smart standards. Uh, we've also discussed over the last two days uh, that there could be you know, some negative impacts of the smartness in the standards. 
uh, if it is not controlled properly. So it will also be incumbent upon all of us that the systems that we develop take care of these uh, pitfalls too. Uh, digital transformation also provides us a galaxy of opportunity to the IT and the ITS sector. Of course, uh, that is a call out to our industry stakeholders who are here. Uh, regarding development of many tech tools, codes, protocols, testing and maintenance services with regard to star smart. Uh, the example of stakes and taxi that were presented today in the realm of cyber security uh, stand out uh, in that. And uh, this uh, transition from paper-based and PDF standards to XML and machine interpretable uh, standards will be a tectonic shift in this rail and we should now all be prepared to embrace this uh, gone are the days where we should we were discussing that should we uh, now the question has shifted to how should we and how soon should we uh, so that is what this uh, two days uh, brainstorming has uh, taught us and as they say when you start learning any language especially in, in the English language when we start learning we start learning with the uh, a, B, C, D. So I'll say that we'll also have to embrace A, B, C, D with respect to smart. Uh, A as in assessing the respective ISO, IEC, NSB's capabilities. B as in bridging the needs of the user with the industry offerings. C as in collaborating for capacity building and process improvements. And D as in digital tools and technology for smart. So uh, let us join together start learning the ABCD of digital transformation and see to it that we soon reach the XYZ and start reading the benefits. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Over to you, Nisha. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> now, as a token of appreciation to our speakers, we will be presenting mementos to the dignitaries. I would first uh, like to request Mr. Sanjay Pant, Deputy Director General Standardization BIS, to come on dais to kindly present the memento to Mr. Martla Hale Solomon Peter, Acting Head uh, Standards Division uh, SEBS. Sir, please come on the dais. Uh, now, Mr. R.K. Tyagi, uh, Deputy Director General, Central Region, BIS, to present a memento to Mr. Vimal Mahindru, IEC Vice President and SMB Chair. Sir, please. Mr. Rajiv Sharma, Deputy Director General Standardization, uh, to kindly present to Mr. Jill Thonet, Deputy Secretary General IC. Ms. Chitra Gupta, Deputy Director General, FMCS Registration and Hallmarking BIS, to present it to Ms. Mara Rolando, Head of PMO ISO. Ma'am, please.
Ms. Nishat S. Huck, Deputy Director General Laboratory to Mr. David Nix, Digital Transformation Officer IC. Ma'am and sir, please come to the dais. Mr. Kumar Shantanu, Deputy Director General Administration, BIS, to present to Mr. Hussein Hadi, Head of Publishing ISO. May I now request Mr. Rajneesh Khosla, Head International Relations, to come and join us for the group photo. Dr. Bhattacharya, one of our speakers, had to proceed and the speakers who joined us online are uh, not present with us at present. We are indebted to them, uh, to each of them for participating uh, in this workshop to make it successful. And now in the end, I request all of you to kindly join us for networking tea. A big thanks to We are really thankful to Miss Mariam Imani, BSI, Dr. Deminin, DKE, Ashok, uh, Mr. Ashok Ganeshan, Sen Senelek, Dr. Sudeep Oberoi, and uh, Dr. Pushpak Bhattachara for their wonderful uh, presentations. A big thanks to all our esteemed speakers, participants, and the organizing team behind the uh, scenes. Thank you, everyone.